I just wanted to show the final position between Twamborg and Andre Gorovets okay. if you still have that board up. I do. Whoa, what? <laughs> no way. I know, it's beautiful. No way. Also, Eric Hansen just lost his game of hand up, but what is this? Oh no. Are you kidding me with three queens, excuse me, four queens? <laughs> So that means white didn't resign for a long time and black felt disrespected. Gorovets was not happy about it. So let's see what actually yeah. happened. So he queened the B pawn and they traded queens and then he queened the A pawn. And then he said, I don't want to check me. Of course I can, but I'm just going to queen all my pawns. And here comes the H pawn now. And okay, finally decided to checkmate him. So that is... Well, Grandmaster Robert Hess here with the one and only International Master Anna Rudolph. Anna, I'm so happy to be commentating alongside you again today. Uh, thank you so much, Robert. I think I turn as red as my t-shirt every time you introduce <laughs> me, but it's an honor to be commentating with you. I can't wait for the, today's Battle Royale and the debut of world number four, Anish Giri. That's what I'm really, really excited about. Yeah, you know, you and I were talking before the show about Anish Giri, and, well, he needs no introduction to the broader chess world, does he? He's one of the top players in the world, and hopefully for the Montreal Chess Bras, he brings his A game to the Pro Chess League. I think so. I think that's what it's about for today. And there was a little Twitter banter between the bras and Anish Kiri. I just wanted to remind everyone that the Chess Bras have announced the flash sale for these couple of days. And the promo code is Anish. And then Anish hit back with a tweet saying, when the joke was right there, but the bra was too greedy to make it. <laughs> since the discount is not 50%, but 20. I actually saw that and I found it hilarious because, yeah. you know, he, I love that he can poke fun at himself for, uh, you know, the perceived too many draws of the past. But Anna, if you had to make a prediction, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. How many points is Anish Giri scoring out of the seven possible games today? Seven. Seven out of seven? <laughs> I think he's going to score five and a half, to be honest. Okay. What about you? Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's a pretty good prediction. He is my choice for board one of my fantasy team. I think five and a half feels pretty accurate. Let me pull up this scene where I have all the scoreboard here just to show who some of his competitors will be. Right, We have Sergei Grigoriansk for the Moscow Wizards. Nikita Meshkov, so he's playing right now with the Estonia Horses. 
Luka Lenish of the Turtles, Bador Jabawa, Tomchak of the B Bears, Postney, and J you know, I'm actually going more than five and a half. The more I look at this, the more hmm. I, I say, Anish Giri is just too good. He's too good. So I'm going with six. Six. Yeah. And after you, your prediction, I think you got to tell us about this Rook A7 move that Anish has just played. It's called protecting your Rook by putting it on a hanging square, right? <laughs> <laughs> but is this theory? I have no idea, but based on how quickly he has played it, I assume it is theory, but it actually makes a lot of sense. So the problem was you couldn't take this, a move ago you couldn't take this Knight on B5 because you would lose your Rook uh, by the Queen. By playing rook a7, yeah. you're now threatening a takes b5. And if you go knight a7, I go queen takes b2, hitting f2, hitting the rook on a1, hitting the knight on c3. And that's just a ridiculous triple attack that I don't see how white will defend everything. So this is a temporary rook sacrifice, but after queen takes b2, black's attack is way too dangerous. I'm loving this rook a7 move. I've never seen it. I wonder if this is a novelty at all or simply it's a not so well-known variation that we are looking at. But I think White was definitely surprised by this move, Mashkovs. I mean, what is Bishop... E Can I just take a piece? Like, what if I just... Yes. <laughs> okay, I, I get... the I, best reaction. Anna, knights are tricky, though, because the knight on e5 and the knight on g4, they need to protect each other. So White is, at some moments, soon threatening to move pawn to h3. So I guess the question is, if I play a takes b5 and you play queen takes b5 back, if I have to take you on b5, well, then I'm not happy because knight takes b5 back, and then white will play the move h3 and win mm -hmm. the knight on e5 or the knight on g4. Yes, indeed. So after a takes b5, queen takes b5, we shall look for a different move for black. Okay. The queen is hanging, so it's got to be a queen move. Oh, maybe queen d8 so you can protect your... You go rook a5 to protect your knight on <gasps> e5. Genius. Whoa. If this is working, this is beautiful geometry. Queen d8, so that after h3, rook a5 intermediate move, protecting the knight. Wow. Also, bishop takes e, in case of queen d8, bishop takes e5, rook a5, and then black wins back the piece and will be a piece up. <gasps> Although maybe white can sacrifice the queen somehow with like after your bishop takes e5, rook a5, bishop takes g4, rook takes b5, knight takes b5, and I'm not sure if this works out, but that knight and bishop combination on e5 and b5 looks pretty scary to deal with in the c7 square. I'm really impressed with this variation. I, I think this is a great start for debuting world number four, Anish Giri. Of course, he his theoretical knowledge is impressive. We have always known that, but rook a7, what a move. And Meshko's reacting maybe in not the best way. Yeah, and this is one of the fun things I do, Anna, and I know you do listen when I'm doing commentary with Alexandra, but sometimes you miss things. Sam Copeland, you hear? Sam Copeland, I'm nominating this <laughs> I, game. I know that, I know that, I know that. <laughs> Note already for the upcoming article on the Pro Chess League, and I see that in the chat for the game of Anish Giri, there's no other than Mr. Eric Hansen, the chess bra himself. Isn't he playing his game? What is he doing kibitzing Anish's game? I didn't even see him. Oh, there he is. Go Anish, go. He's just rooting for his teammate there. And should we, you know, we, we should keep an eye on this game because I feel like it could be over pretty soon, except for the fact that Anish started spending his time. Look at his clock. He's under seven minutes yes. left. So queen c6, he, ooh, okay. So right when I was about to have his lead. What's going on now? If queen takes c6. Okay, queen c6, I guess, does he take, so he can't take with a knight. If he takes with the knight on c6, he loses knight on g4. So he'll take with yeah. the d pawn on c6. And that way if h, oh, the bishop on f4 is trapped. So you h3, I move my knight away from e5 to d7, and then I play for pawn to e5. Wow. And after bishop g5, f6, or h6, and g5. Oh, so yeah, you take here, I go e5, bishop g5, f6, and your bishop has one safe square on h4, and I go g5 and trap your bishop. Wow. Beautiful. Wow. And so if you take on c6, and I play d takes, bishop takes, uh, sorry, h3, knight d7, what if I take on g4 with the bishop so that my, once you play e5, I take your knight d7 with check, I think you play this move h5 first to kick the bishop off of g4. Because if you played e5, bishop d7 check, bishop takes d7, and then white will take the e5 pawn. So by playing Indeed. h5, you distract that bishop away, and then you play e5. This is amazing stuff by Anish Giri. 
We shall see if this is going to be on the board, but I think your prediction, the analysis that Robert has come up with is exactly what Anish is planning after Queen takes C6. We are expecting D takes C6. What an incredible position. This is only move 13 and already both players are going extremely creative, but only one of them can be right. <laughs> and it's definitely Anish is right. He's going to play. So this is very important why he took with the pawn on C6. If he taken with a knight instead, then this knight would have come to B5. And that's going to be a problem on the c7 square, and it looks like white is getting out. So that is why, just to reinforce that, he did ex, ex Oh my gosh. Anisha is a genius. 97, I, I you're a genius. I heard when Alexandra said, Robert Hess is not allowed to participate in the Protest League because he would be immediately accused of computer assistance <laughs> for all the great moves that he's making. I agree with Alexandra Robo Hess. So there we go, Robert predicting exactly the same moves as world number four Anish Giri well, plays. Honestly, he helped me out because I thought queen d8 was the move. He played queen c6, and then I'm like, why would he do that? It's because he's a genius. And I hate that I'm complimenting him because, you know, we're, we're both friends with Anish. <laughs> he'll love the fact that he's being talked about in such a positive manner, and he'll never let me live it down. So we're going to have to <laughs> either change his game or hope that he... No, of course, I don't want him to play worse, but, you know, all, all jokes aside, Anish is just such a wonderful person and a wonderful player and I mean games like this just this opening preparation and then finding queen c6 and knight d7 a very obscure retreat that is going to win him material yes and uh, once again a reminder they have only made 14 moves and black is winning already because this uh, bishop is going to be trapped after bishop g5 f6 and g5 important that it's not h6 and g5 uh, because that would be a pin on the h file and bishop takes g5 would be possible yep in fact h6 wouldn't even attack the bishop to begin with so you could play a move like e4 but you're right bishop h4 and then g5 i take it yeah indeed h6 is not threatening anything you're completely right a3 um trying well <laughs> trying to make <laughs> the best of a bad situation so after you take on f4 i'll take back probably with the g pawn and i'll say you know what i have two pawns for the piece so perhaps I can survive. Of course, he's not going to survive, and he will win once he takes his bishop. And it's just a matter of a pretty simple technique because the two pawns aren't advanced enough of restricting black's pieces. Black's piece g6, bishop g7 is what I would consider right away, just getting this mm -hmm. bishop onto the best diagonal. And um, yeah, just looking very nice for a niche. Knight c5 as well is a good option. Yeah, I was going to say the same, that he can develop easily, and then the, the light squares on the queen side are also weak, and I love knight c5, knight b3 ideas, but g6, bishop g7, uh, it's a piece up, and for a world number four, that's uh, already a sign game. Of course, he's going to still be careful. No one can just relax and say, I'm completely winning, and I don't need to look for the best moves, but this is going to be an easy game for Anish. For sure. So um, we'll, we'll let Anish finish this one off. Are there any other games that have particularly caught your eye in this round? I mean, I'm sure there's... I think now that we have started with the Chess Bros, let's just have a quick look at the board too as well. Eric Hansen with the white pieces against Jan Elvis. Jan Elvis playing for the Estonia horses. And today is really important for the horses because they haven't been doing very well. And at the Battle Royale, there's more points at stake. So for teams that are struggling and they are at the bottom of the standings of their divisions, like the horses, if they get one of the top spots today, then they still have a chance, but only if they can do it Ab today. Absolutely. And I pulled up the standings there real quick just to show that they're in last place in the Eastern Division. And on the other side of that, the Tbilisi gentlemen, well ahead with 140 points. So they almost have secured their qualification for the playoffs already. Actually, they probably already have because the top four teams from every division do qualify for the playoffs. Indeed, the Tbilisi gentlemen have collected more points than anyone. As we can see, the Armenia Eagles are only second in the Eastern Division. They would be first in any other <laughs> division. Any other. Yep, but the uh, gentlemen are not so gentle when it comes to beating up on the other teams in the Chess League. And, well, speaking of players who beat up uh, other players, I mean, not physically, but over the chessboard, Eric Hansen, is obviously one of the uh, very popular streamers. He's of chess bra fame. And here with the white pieces, Anna, I know it came from a French, and you're going to say, well, Robert hates the French, but I actually like Black's position. Yay! Finally, Robert admits <laughs> his love for the French defense. Thank you so much, Robert. <laughs> I don't know if I'm admitting love for the French defense, but I'm admitting some appreciation for Jan Elvis' position. The reason I say that is because this pawn on e5, I'm always concerned when there's a pawn on e5 that it's going to somehow be attacked multiple times and it can't be defended with another pawn 
And I think that's an easier pawn to target than say if we trade on e6, that e6 pawn is not that easy to get to. So, um, you know, seeing many Frenches in my life and seeing a rook on c7 as well, which defends the seventh rank and allows for a doubling on the c file to hit the c2 pawn, I have to prefer Jan Elvis' position here. That's bad news for the bras, although even, even if I like this position a lot for black, it's not so easy to convert it into a full point. So dream positions in the French defense may mean a slight advantage, <laughs> in fact. But it's something, it's something. So we're gonna see, we got to see this a little bit later. Shall we briefly look at the board three and four, even though we're gonna be focusing on the, on the top players mainly, but I'm curious about this match. As we said that the horses badly need a good battle royale today. And for the chess bras, well, they were leading their division and uh, right now they are not on a qualification spot. So the first four teams qualify in each division, as Robert already said, and the bras are on the fifth place. So this match actually is crucial for both of these teams. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, you have to get wins early because there's something said for confidence, right? If you start winning yeah. early, you feel better about your chances. If you start going down in the standings, you're like, oh no, I have to win. And when you play that kind of chess, like I have to win games, is when you play your, at your absolute worst. It's very subjective. Oh, H5 here looks like a good move, by the way, for uh, Tuan Berg of the horses. Because the problem with for black after H5 is you can't capture on H5 because then bishop takes F5 wins a pinned pawn. Uh, but yeah. that would be a, this would be a very important game for the horses to win because it's two relatively evenly matched players here with uh, 25, low 2,500 playing a high 2,400, right? So um, it seems like... This is, and especially with the position on I mean, I, I guess you can explain this maybe better than I can. So when you're up this material here in this end game, but you see that two on one on the queen side, how confident do you feel in white's chances to secure the full point here? I was very confident before. Now I see these multiple trades on the king side, and I think that he could have done somewhat better. So the less pawns are there on the board, the more likely that black can survive. I don't know why Twanburg went for these multiple pawn trades instead of creating a potential pass pawn on the king side too. I feel like he may be a little overconfident and now I start to see chances for black. It's only two pawns versus one and the black king has been activated. What do you think, Robert? No, I completely agree. And a big problem is the rook needs some squares of infiltration, for example, d6 or b6. But the problem is from b6, my, I don't attack anything, from d1, now knight f7 comes, and then knight comes to e5, protecting that c6 square so you can't just push your c pawn up the board, and my knight on e5 can then go to g4, and I can start pushing my pawn. So e5 here is certainly an option. I mean, play for e5, try to play for e4. The uh, lone problem with playing moves like e5 is you sometimes have to be careful about your f5 pawn, but here white's not in time because rook f1 isn't a check. So I would play the move e5, and then just try to play e4, and the counterplay of my advanced past pawns, I think is good enough for black to hold the bounce here. And I wouldn't be surprised, Anna, if somehow black becomes better in this position because the pawns are wow. faster. Wow, that would be that would be quite quite a twist if black manages to get the upper hand in this game. But for now, I completely agree that white must have messed things up. And finally, we reach a position where black is doing OK to survive. It still could be anything, of course. But earlier, White definitely was in a winning position, and we are not sure it's still, still such an advantage. On their board four, uh, d5 has just been played. If we can briefly look at that Whoa. moment, because it's critical, this pawn cannot be taken because the knight on f5 is hanging. Oh, I love moves like d5, and I mean, I think Black just has a nice position, I, unless, I, that's my initial reaction, unless I allow this move knight takes e7 to happen, then my king feels a little bit iffy, but... The move d5 just, I mean, it looks great. You can't take it, like you said. Mm -hmm. Where's that queen even going? Uh, great question. Where shall it go? It doesn't have so many squares. And then black can either take on e4 or push d4. Both look very tempting. Yeah, I mean, queen a6 is an option. But then all of a sudden, like you said, d4 might be an even better move than taking the pawn. Uh, because I can always take that knight on f5. And maybe even in the initial position, I could take on f5 and then play for pawn to d4 and say, well, my pawn on d4 is the most valuable pawn on the board, and uh, may two bishops be damned, essentially. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if the chess bras will 
survive this round, but it's ups and downs, <laughs> ups and downs on plenty of the boards. Yep. How is Eric doing? And shall we check back also uh, with board one? Although Anish gave it a piece up, should be very comfortable in winning. Yeah. So that's one point for the Bras. I went to Anish's game very quickly here, and his rook's on a3. He's He just won the pawn that was there. His king is on e7, but who cares about king safety when it's in... Uh, you know, the queens have been traded off and you're up a piece like this. So, yeah, this looks completely yeah. winning for a niche. Back to Eric Hansen. Well, whoa. Okay. So, he could have taken this rook whoa. on c4. Oh, what has happened? He didn't take this rook on c4 because he didn't want to make a draw. Right? Queen b4 check, queen c3 check, and we just go back and forth. That would have been an immediate draw. So, Hansen playing for more, which is either a very risky decision or a great decision because... I like the queen on f2, so you're ready to take on e6 and go queen f8 check. But what if black just continues with a move like queen to d4 here and says, if we trade queens, the end game might favor me? Yes, I wonder if Eric is taking too much of a risk because in a rook end game, as Robert pointed out, this rook on the fourth rank would be just collecting first the g4 pawn and then the rest of the gang. So queen d4 is definitely a move. Black should be considering here. Also, yeah, uh, Elvis is up three minutes. Uh -oh. Eric is below one minute. So he's definitely feeling confident about his chances, but I don't know if objectively speaking, he made the right decision. Yeah, it looked like a moment where you just say, you know, say I, okay, I'm higher rated, I had the white pieces, but my opponent played really well. And I think that's a big problem with the ratings in general, Anna, is that when you have um, the higher rating, you often pressure yourself to win games. But... Yeah. You just got to play the board. And right now, I don't see how white can be better. And especially with the time situation, like we're pointing out, 20 seconds, 23 seconds now. And what's your queen doing on h2? That's not what you wanted to do when you played this. Now black can play queen f4 and say, let's yeah. try to trade the queens again. And I'm improving the placement of my pieces. I think Jan Elvis, very experienced grandmaster, was one of the top handful of players in the world back in the 90s. Still has a lot of game left in him. Queen f4 here, and I think he's going to beat the chess bra, Eric Hansen. Probably. And in that case, uh, I'm a big fan of the chess bras, but I think Eric, if he didn't go for the draw and then he ends up losing, it, all that he can do is blame himself for not wanting to accept the draw in a position where he had less time and the position was more dangerous for him than his opponent. Yeah, and this roving queen could just take the pawn on g4 now. How many times have we seen this rook stay under attack? But you can just like yeah. queen takes g4, attacking the queen on... Oh, okay. That is not the move uh, I was... Surprising. It's still good. Still good for black, I think. But he could have just taken a pawn. And look at Eric trying to create an outside pass pawn. But Jan says, well, the extra pawn is more than worth it for me. Because what Eric wants to do is play for g5 and spring this h pawn free. But playing g5 would actually just sacrifice another pawn. And thus is probably not good in the, for the near future. Yeah, I think Eric is in trouble. Now the question is if he can save it. Of course, there's, there are still chances, but he must be already upset that he ended up being a pawn down instead of just agreeing to a draw. Yeah, sometimes it's good to take a risk. Other times, it's just not the choice to make, especially in a team event. Um, you want to get as many points as possible, but you're going to get zero points when you lose the game. So uh, you know, I don't want to yeah. be overcritical. I just think that that was really a moment where... Um, you know, I understand the decision-making. I just don't agree with it. Totally. And I think Robert and I can criticize Eric because this has happened to us multiple times, too. Oh, yeah. When instead of taking a draw, we end up losing because we are too confident about our chances. So we have been there. We know how it feels. Uh, yeah, this is going to be a rough game. Been there way too many times, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's one of those do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do moments where I'm like, I tell everybody, if you're playing someone, ignore the ratings, just you know, play your best chess. And then sometimes I play someone who's slightly low rated, I'm like, oh, I gotta go beat them. Wait, G4 is hanging. Take that pawn. Take G4. Yeah, why not? Okay, he doesn't want to give up his H6 pawn because he doesn't want to see a pass pawn. But I mean, Anna, how do you deal with that, right? Well, like Queen E4 takes G4, it just feels, and Rook takes C2 at some point is an option as well. But um, how do you deal with that, right? You, you, you're up a pawn, but... Mm -hmm. If you give up this H pawn, you see that your opponent has like the most advanced pawn in the position. So how do you determine yeah. when it's right to just tr trade and simplify a little bit or to just keep protecting this H pawn? I think Alice is being practical, looking at Hansen and the 
time situation, nine seconds only for Eric. So if he keeps the H pawn alive, I think that's better for the time scramble because Eric has to come up with more creative moves than just pushing the H pawn if he had a pass pawn. Yeah. So I think it, it, for this situation, this is a better practical chance that he keeps the H pawn and Eric has to come up with something different than having a pass pawn that he can just push and push and push. I completely agree with you. Actually, and now he can take the G pawn without losing the H pawn. So what Jan did was th oh. he threatened pawn to D3, and he scared Eric off away from the king side. And now all of a sudden he's up a second pawn. So actually, you're, what you said it 100% came true. He posed practical problems, and Eric was unable to solve them, probably because of the position, but also because of the clock. Yeah. So now it's two pawns up. Still no time for Eric. This is a really, really. Mission impossible to somehow save it, but in Blitz games, anything can happen. We have seen Rook blunders. I, I watched your commentary with Alexandra and uh, Lac Van Gliem hanging. Was it Lac Van Gliem? I think we went. No, Lac Van, I think. We oh. just hang a Rook yes, Lac in the Rook end game. So anything can happen. Anything can happen, but in normal circumstances, Elvis is winning this game. Anish has won on top board, so it's going to be 1 1. There's a draw between Twamborg and Norwich Sin. Yep. And board four, I'm just going to have a quick look at it. Ooh, it's how many pawns up? Three pawns up for the player of the Estonia horses. <laughs> yeah, and opposite colored bishops, sometimes you can, now it's four pawns up. You can make a draw even down a bunch of pawns. Not here. Too many uh, pawns for the horses on that board. So back to this Hansen game. Okay, I think Elvis will win. Well, we can stay with this one until it finishes, and then there are a handful of other games still going on here. Um, I see Convert Holt is playing Alex Shabalov. That's for USA fans. That's a very common matchup you see. Wait, I think Shabalov just lost in time. Sorry? Jababa? No, Shabalov. Alex oh, is super yeah, bliss. Like, yeah. Jababa? <laughs> <laughs> no, Jababa doesn't lose on he time. He never loses on time. <laughs> yeah, and uh, actually, speaking of Jababa, did he. How did he do? He, what, he drew his game. Yeah. He has drawn uh, against Gr Grig Sergei Grigorian's top board of the Wizards. Yep. Wait, also, in this game between Eric Hansen, um, Elvis could have won his queen with queen b5 check and move 61. But instead of playing queen b5, winning the queen, yeah. he, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he decided to do this. Okay, look at this. The technical way to win this game, up a pawn for black, trade the queens off, and get into an easily winning king and pawn endgame. So, He's like, who needs a queen up when I can just show my superior king and pawn endgame knowledge? Yep. So that was a win. So we have two games left. Oh, sorry, three games left. We have um, GMG versus Wonderful Time. Let's check out that one. That is Tuan Min Lee versus Andre Gorovets. And let's actually flip this board. And white is up a pawn here for Gorovets. But I've seen plenty of draws in this endgame lately, including in this champion showdown. However, this is not the way to get said draw. What you need for black is to have your king on f5 and the white rook behind the pawns. Although. Mm -hmm. There's still, no, now it's now it's winning. But there's still sometimes chances to hold. Um, oh. So when is he going to finally make it prog? Oh, he blundered his rook. <gasps> he blundered his rook. He has hung the rook. Gorvets simply hangs his rook. Oh, I'm like trying to figure out what's the best way to make progress here. Is there, and he just hung his, on a, on a it feels terrible, man. I was referring to the other battle royale where Lac Van Gliem hang a rook when he was the one trying to win the rook end game oh. uh, with his pass pawns, and now it happens again. Wow. Oh, that's uh, that's not good. Anna... And that was the one and only trick he could fall into. Yep. And I, I pulled up the last game of the round between Luka Pechadzi and Vlad Dobrov. And Dobrov trying to win up two pawns in this endgame, but it's always tricky when you have just a rook pawn. And I say, <laughs> I thought you were going to say, it's always tricky when you play a rook endgame with two pawns up, you may hang your rook. <laughs> no, I'm not as clever as you are, Anna. So, uh, yeah, you beat me to the joke here. But, I mean, when you have this, okay, that's, this is good technique by Dobrov. He put his king to touch the pawn so that his pawn can start pushing itself. And look at this, you move his king first. You don't want to have your pawn h2. Because in rook endgames, if your pawn's on h2 and your king is in front of the pawn, then it, or, sorry, not in front of the rook is in front of the pawn, then it makes it much harder to win. Here, black is in everything. Right play rook g3 or rook f2, bring your king out, and then push the pawn. So I'd play rook f3. He doesn't want to do it, but he's going to play rook to the g file, king to g1, and then the h pawn finally queens. 
Yeah, and White is also running out of time, so it's both a winning position and no time for White. Finally, a rook end game where Black managed to keep his rook on the board and promote his pass pawn. Yep, can't stop this pawn from going to h1 without losing your rook. So Pechazzi will resign, and that means Dobrov wins for the Moscow Wizards. So let's bring up the, yeah. the full scoreboard just to see kind of throughout the, the event here. So Jeffrey Zhang won his game for the Destiny, Conrad Holt as well. Andre Gorbitz is the, the player who just blundered his rook. So the, <laughs> the Destiny would have three and a half out of four if it was not Whoa. for that rook blunder because he was up two pawns in that ending. That is just uh, feels bad, man. Totally feels bad, man. And I, I agree with Benjamin that that was a chess bra move, if we recall all of the multiple rook hangings that the chess bras produced in the previous Pro Chess League sessions. Uh, it's becoming a theme. It's becoming a theme. Yikes. And speaking of yikes, well, I guess this win by the Wizards will be added, uh, but Vlad, Vlad Dobrov gets the win. Sergei Gregorian drew against Madro Jabawa, but... The bottom two boards, as has been all season for the Tbilisi gentlemen, you see that Kubaradze and Volkov, right? They are having the leaders for this team, despite being on board four. And um, I picked Kubaradze for my fantasy team, so good on him for getting the win. <laughs> Let's go with, with them for the rest. I don't have a fantasy team for this week. Unfortunately, I was too late packing in and getting to the airport so I couldn't submit my fantasy chess team for this week. That means that, Greg, for now, your 10K is safe, but next week, I promise I'm going for you. I'm going for you. <laughs> and actually, on a, something I just noticed as I look at the scoreboard there, no team won by more than a two and a half, one and a half margin, so a very tight first round. Yeah, it just goes to show how difficult these battle royals are. And for those of you who are not familiar with the format, this is a round robin. So you're going to see board ones always facing board ones, board twos against board twos. Everyone plays everyone, seven rounds in total. And there's more points at stake than usual. Therefore, any team who is at the bottom of the standing so far, this is their chance to bounce back. And the teams that are about to qualify for the playoffs, they need to stay at the top. They cannot just pour out and give their their rooks and their points away today. Right, absolutely not. And I brought up the, uh, the all the logos, the teams. I love the Moscow Wizards logo. I always say this, but uh, these are all the teams in the league. And um, just been a very fun season thus far. It will continue to be. So let's uh, pull up the chessboard back again. And whew, I don't even know which match to focus on. And each Geary is always a good place to be, I feel like. You know, his game. Yeah, I think it's since it's his debut and we are talking about none other than the world number four, we got to stick to Anish Giri in most of the round, but we will, of course, always look at other boards as well. Yeah, for sure. And Anish, um, he has the black pieces again, so he just won a nice game with the black pieces, and now he has black again, this time against Tomshak from the I think he just saw the field and that he's like one or 200 points above everybody else and he said okay I can take seven blacks I'm okay with that. <laughs> he's like as long as I give two whites to my other teammates I'm down to do that so yeah um, you know and also in Waikonze if we remember how he was doing he won all his games at the beginning of the tournament with black yep so the joke was that he should have played all games with black. even Ser Sergei Karyakin tweeted about that yeah. And Fabiano Caruana. The two of them were making jokes on Anish and his black games. And it honestly makes a lot of sense in sort of what we were referring to before when a player is the white pieces because statistically, you know, white does better and you have the first move, so you have an advantage on the chessboard. You feel more pressure to win your games. But when you're playing Anish Giri, mm -hmm. and even if you are uh, Magnus Carlsen, Caruana, Mamajarov, etc., it's not easy to beat this guy, right? There's a reason why his rating is almost 2,800. And um, yeah. in this particular game, I like what Tom Jack has done in the sense that he's clarified his plan to continue trying to uh, keep a hold of the d5 square. Knight a3 to c2, followed by knight to c2 to b4 uh -huh. is a typical plan here. And if you ever play f5, and this is his Magnus Carlsen idea with the king on h8, rook to b8, I mean, uh, he did this in, in Waikanze, so perhaps this influenced Geary. Whenever you play f5, you have to be very concerned about how that impacts your remaining light squares. Because if the bishops get traded after you play f5 and we trade on f5, then strategically white, white is almost winning, 
with the light square control. So it's something that's important to keep in mind when you play a movie like F5, it looks aggressive, but it has clear drawbacks as well. Indeed, that was a very good summar summary of this particular variation of the Sveshnikov. As Robert said, this was already played by Magnus just a few weeks ago. Now, Magnus is not playing in the Proches League yet, and some of the teams started tweeting Magnus Carlsen uh, which team he should join. So there's a bid for the world champion, and I wonder if any of the teams will manage to get him for the last few weeks, because this is week seven, and there will be three more weeks before the Pro Chess League playoffs. So Magnus Carlsen could still join. He could still join if one of the teams manages to convince him. I somehow doubt that he is going to join the league, but if he does join, I, I mean, the gnomes feel like a pretty good choice for him going to his local squad. But um, yeah, I think he's uh, going to sit this one out. Just my guess, my educated guess, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the teams that uh, tweeted at Magnus was the Berlin Bears saying that he would definitely, he could definitely take it as a challenge to make a team that is at the bottom of the standings qualify for the playoffs. So if he joins the Bears, there's a challenge. Yeah, no, if he joins the Bears, well, they're going to be a very happy, Bears, I mean, they're predatorial, right? Kind of. I mean, some Bears are kind of nice, <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, from gnomes to Bears, the New York Marshals also would love to have Magnus on their squad. Actually, which team wouldn't like to have Magnus Carlsen? No, it's very true. And, um, well, Magnus is kind of a bear, right? You know, they don't like, I guess bears, of course, they're predators, but they don't really have predators. Like, no, they're not prey to anybody. And I, that feels pretty accurate for Magnus because he's hmm. the number one player in the world and has been for a very long time. Yeah. Whew. So... Who... <laughs> you got away with it, Robert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, wh where do we go? Which, uh, which game? So I have the Geary game up, of course, but it looks like they're playing a little bit more positionally right now is there any game with tactical fireworks that we can yeah i think the jobava's game is looking promising it's uh, lexi sexy with the white pieces against first second aka nikita mashkovs from the estonia horses the top team of the eastern division versus, versus the bottom team the estonia horses trailing now we're talking and that's when H4. this is a position to talk about yes so on a you see the move h4 you have the black pieces, sorry, because white's position is just better here. How do you even try to defend a position like this, knowing what's about to happen on the king side? Uh, tough situation because we clearly see Harry moving up the board. Harry 5 is a threat, opening up the H file. With opposite side castling, this is really typical. Both players are about to launch a pawn storm to open up files against the opponent's king, but white is arriving earlier. Black can't even push B5 yet because that square is controlled by three of the white pieces. And A6, B5 looks like a grandpa, grandpa strategy. I was going to say grandma, but let's make it grandpa. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's A6, B5. Whoa, he played B5. Oh, B5 is on the board, but I would definitely take it. I'm a pawn grabber. You know, it's funny. I was watching the champion showdown yesterday with uh, um, Jennifer Shahadi and Yasser Serwan. And Yasser, uh, sorry, Jennifer said, oh, I'm, I think you just grabbed the pawn here. And Yasser froze because Yasser is the ultimate greedy commentator. He wants to take pawns all the time. Yeah. And he just is like, I'm so proud of you. You know, after working together for six years, you finally <laughs> become a pawn grabber. And, you know, Jabal was a checkmater and not a pawn grabber, it appears, because he didn't take on b5. He said, I'm just going to mate you down the h file. So if you put h takes g6 now and then f takes g6, can't I just go rook takes h7 and don't care about my knight on c3 Ooh, and just try to totally. check you? Yeah, but does not care. This is typical Jabawa. He could have taken the b5 pawn, but instead he just wants to give mate. And h takes g6 is on the board after f takes. Rook takes h7. As Robert has called it, this could be it. This could be game over. Yeah, this is looking very painful because you could take this knight on c3, and I think it's worth exploring why taking on c3 doesn't actually work out so mm -hmm. well. White just plays queen to h5. Right? You just ignore yeah. your king because your king's not getting mated yet. And there's already checkmate in one threat with queen h7. Oh, it's brutal. It's a brutal position here for black to deal with. So the knight is captured and queen h... Oh, oh no, he hasn't played it. Sorry, no. I thought that... I was looking at the analysis board, but black is still sinking. In either case, I think 
both F takes G6, Rook takes H7, and B takes C3, Queen H5. I don't see how oh. I, how Black can survive. So the, he takes the knight. And after Queen B4. H5. B4. He went B4. I love oh. it. <laughs> He's, he, he's a genius. He's just saying, you don't even get a potential attack on my king. So I play b4, you can't get to my a3 pawn, which is the way you need to uh, go to checkmate me. And now he's going to play g7. He's, Jabal was a beast. He's just... He is a beast. And we have some behind-the-scenes information from Pro Chess League Commissioner Greg Shahadi. Since the, there are cameras on every player, we can't show the cameras, but they are being observed. And he's saying that Jabawa is dancing nonstop during the game. <laughs> well, I would be dancing if I had this position as well, because the move G7, people are like, wait, why G7? Wasn't H7 hanging? Yeah, you could have played Rook takes H7. Do not play G takes H7. That's what you call an umbrella pawn. It actually defends the enemy king. So you wouldn't want to umbrella take... Umbrella pawn, I love it. Yeah, and in fact, your great friend, Yudha Polgar, had an article in New and Chess magazine where she had an article about umbrella pawns in the... Was the the January issue, I believe, of uh, New and Chess. So, if, for those of you who subscribe, I uh, Dirk Janvin Tenguzadam was in Waikanze, and he actually showed me a copy. So I was happy to see that. But the point is that sometimes pawns in front of the king actually help your king, even if it's an enemy pawn. Indeed, you can find shelter under the umbrella pawn. I didn't know it was called umbrella pawn, but I love to have those pawns on the board so that I can hide. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, look at G4 is going to come on the board for Jabal. He's just blasting open the position. His king still somehow remains safe despite a pawn being on B4. And um, just what a, what a player. What a great player. Indeed. I agree with Benjamin Feingold. Shout out to Grandmaster Feingold, who's here with us in the chat. He's saying that it's Rihanna's favorite pawn. <laughs> nice. The umbrella Ella, Ella A. Yeah, the L.I.A. Uh, talking about my umbrella. Okay, I'm not going to sing, but it's now stuck in my head. So thank you, Ben Feingold, for getting that song stuck in my head. Uh -huh. G4, typical Jababa, but what a brilliant game. Giving up the C3 knight, them going B4. He's not in a rush at all. Okay, he's already an exchange up, but when he was a piece down, he was still not caring too much about the material count. Yep. So go Jabawa. It's not your birthday, I don't think, but you're playing like it is. So yeah, he just, I mean, he's amazing. But he's going to win this game. Are there other games either in this match or in another match that uh, have caught your, caught your eye? Because, yeah, I feel too bad for Nikita Meshkov to continue looking at this position. Just, it hurts. It really hurts. Yeah, we got to switch. Let me look for another in exciting position. Um, I think this could be a potentially nice attack between Wonderful Time and Gamma Grandma. Gamma Grandma, I like that. And Wonderful yeah, Time. Yeah, that is Vasily Usmanov and Ooh. Tuan Min Li. I feel like I'm looking at a ginger GM game with the white pieces because he got rid of his <laughs> his Harry for his opponent's Gary, and now the G mm -hmm. file is open. Rook C to G1 is coming. Rook G8 is going to be a mating attack. There's no way Black can defend this position. I have absolutely no faith in black's ability to defend here it just looks like a brutal attack the bishop on b7 is no match for this amazing knight on e5 it's one of the best pieces i've ever seen in my life i agree with you it's a good knight versus bad bishop plus all the heavy pieces of white are way stronger and more active and the king is the white king is way safer than the black king so it has to be curtains in a few moves rook g8 check um, he can take them on h7 or rook g7 isn't it just game over already yeah i mean rook g8 check you sacrifice your queen for the rooks but then you queen g5 check at the end picking up this rook on f6 because the king can't protect it you'd have to play a move like rook g6 and then queen d8 check picking up the other rook i mean just a, a very clear cut victory happening here for the pittsburgh pawn grabbers they're going to be very happy that he may have blundered away no he won the first game right he's the one who was the recipient of that rook blunder Yes. <laughs> wow, so he's just, I mean, he's in, okay, the first game he got a bit fortunate. This doesn't look like fortunate at all. It just looks like a simple crush. So w well played by him. Queen h4, threatening rook g8 check. That way the rook on f6 will be hanging. I mean, this is just such a bad position for black that pretty much any move for white was winning. Yeah, what a fine move, queen h4. I was just first puzzled, but simply there's no, no defense against rook g8 now. Yikes. Yikes indeed. Yeah, painful. Let's move on to another board because this is already 
a decisive advantage. I'm looking for another exciting position so that we can show you guys some instructive stuff. Um, oh, I'm going back to Lexi Sexy, but he's he's about to win. Maybe we could see the end of this game. Beautiful. Rook G6 Ooh. has just been played. Everything is pinned. That is, I mean, this is just sweet. Like the long diagonal, the H file, F6 is falling. He's just so good. When he's on his game, he's so amazing, Badur Jabal. Yeah. Like, but when he's off, he's one of those players who could lose to like literally anybody. It, it just he's mm -hmm. like that kind of crazy style where he just has no fear. I don't think he has like an ounce of fear in his body when he plays chess. So he's yeah. able to just like sacrifice all his pieces and either win beautifully or lose what looks like you know in a sort of a coffee house game. Indeed, yeah, the two extremes. But I'm happy that today we are seeing Jabawa at his best. At least so far, it's a very promising start for Lexi Sexy. Yeah, this is just a clear win. So Meshkovs is having a tough start playing against Giri and Jabawa. But okay, most of us in the world would have a tough start playing those two players. And there's no shame in losing to these two incredible grandmasters. Yeah, mentioning Anish Giri, shall we have a look at the position, how it evolved since the opening against Tomchak? Whoa, okay, we're, I got that board up and I'm confused as to whom, who is better here because I see <laughs> even number of pieces. This is always what I do because sometimes I miscount. Um, I'm always now making sure five pawns, five pawns, okay, even. Three pieces, three pieces, okay, even. You know, it just, mm -hmm. there have been games in the pro chess league where I'm like, oh, it's even, and then I realize one side's up a knight. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> important yeah i'm very bad at maths john knows it so i need to double check i have managed to count every single pawn now after knight c7 though i wonder what's happening uh, bishop b3 is one move bishop takes f4 is another move so there are like multiple pawns that can be captured what was so d6 pawn is also in the air this is a little confusing okay so i think some combination of bishop b3 bishop f4 i'm not sure in which move order uh, I think it might transpose because if bishop b3, I guess rook takes d6 will be played. Uh, and if bishop, then bishop takes f4. So bishop b3, rook d6, my bishop on h6 is under attack, so I should probably move it and take on f4. It looks like black got the better of this because I feel like that's a more important pawn, this one on f4. As now, once this bishop moves from f4, I can actually move my f pawn as well. And I feel like white's king feels a little bit less safe than it did. Oh, it took with the e pawn on f4. Oh. Whoa. Interesting. Okay, he's gonna put his knight on e5. Like he, he cleared the e5 square for his knight. I think that was the point, maybe. But he's inviting white to play knight d5. Okay, so rook g6 now, I guess, just to, so knight e6, doesn't it just win everything? I mean, knight e6 hits two rooks and a bishop. Uh... Oh, so they played something different. Yeah. Knight C to Bishop B3. I'm catching up with the latest moves. Wow, what is happening here? I, I, I really cannot tell you. And Geary played that move very fast. I mean, he allowed Knight E6 with a fork on all the pieces. Then up Knight C6 went Knight C8 saying, your rook is having trouble protecting this knight. And so he took on G5. And now Black's king feels iffy. Queen D4 check will win a piece if I can do this in a timely fashion. The Bishop on A4 is hanging over there. Wait. Yeah, why did he not play oh, his blundered. Why just... White blundered his rook. I mean, one of the rooks here. Ah! He, he, stepped into, he stepped into a double attack instead of playing queen d4 earlier. This was such a confusing game. Yeah, it could have... And then, <sighs> I was just going to point out that the two players are on two and a half minutes, but they play like it's a bullet game. <laughs> well, maybe that's why they're missing things from both sides here, because it looked at the start of the position, it looked really good for black. Then all of a sudden it looked good for white. Then black won material, and I'm not sure... Wait, bishop d5, doesn't that win material back? I'm so confused by this game. This game is crazy. <laughs> I mean, Anish should be a bit concerned about his king, but knight e4 is just saying, well, look at queen takes f4, knight f2 check. King g1, knight h3 check. Fork Beautiful. winning the queen. Beautiful, fork knight. This game is kind of awesome. It is awesome, but it was also a little bit dubious at some point. Maybe that's why we are enjoying this much following the game, because it has its ups and downs. Would you be surprised if there's a smother checkmate that happens with queen e7 and eventually knight f2 check and things like that? Here, queen e7. 
So let's see. I'm curious now. Of course, and I should be converting this. This is an exchange up, and not so many pieces left. So there aren't many tricks that White could create. Actually, I don't see a single trick. <laughs> well, the question I have for you, Anna, is: Would you try to trade queens as black, or are you worried that there are not enough pawns left and they're on the same side of the board? So there might like queen e3 check would be a tempting move to many players who think. Oh, trading queens, I'm up material. But how would you evaluate that decision? I think um, it could be a good decision, but I'm also wondering if back should just keep the pressure further. Yeah. Uh, in terms of time situation, it's very even, two minutes for both players. Um, I'm curious to see. I think myself, I would go for the trade of the queens. But I don't know if that's the best decision here. What about you, Robert? Yeah, no, I, I think objectively both decisions are probably level but they're so different right one hand okay h4 is a move that i'm not brave enough to play because i'm worried that now i've given away too many squares in front of my king and now i have a backwards g pawn but to answer the initial question yeah it's really hard to make as black because i think you're right and especially in a blitz game you want to keep that pressure up in a way where there's no risk for black you're not getting checkmated uh, your king yeah. is safer and i think tom Chuck is trying to go queen d4 now like he's saying I'm going to try to trade the queens because if the queens are off the board, I feel like, well, I have an extra pawn. There aren't that many pieces left. Your pawns are disconnected. means they can't protect each other. There's queen d4. I, I like what both sides have done. And look at black saying, I'm not going to take on d4 to help you. You're going to take on f6, and my king's going to be more active. So I really like what both players have done in the last few moves. And I'm torn. I don't know if this is closer to... I, I feel that it's closer to a draw than a win. But there's not much time left, and anything can happen. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I quickly looked at board two of the chess bras. Eric Hansen, with a rough start, he Ooh. refused the draw in the first round, then went on to lose the game. And now, again, he is on the wrong side of an end game. Yeah. Is it like two pawns up for black? <laughs> I'm trying to count. Yes, it's two pawns up, and active pieces, active king. For baby legs, that's Eric Brown from the Berlin Bears. And now he's about to win the, the, another pawn on A3. That's very good decision-making by Braun, just right after the A pawn. Why not? I mean, it's hanging. Um, don't play knight E6. You might want to block the check to keep your king centralized, but then bishop G4 comes in, winning the pin knight. So instead, it was king D6. E4 is well defended. A3 cannot be protected. This should be an easy conversion at this stage for uh, the Berlin Bears board too. So, so far, Anish Giri seems to be winning all of the games for the chess bras, but Eric Hansen is doing the opposite. So yeah. they have 50% between the two of them. And, and Anish had started with two blacks. Eric Hansen started with two whites. And going 0 out of 2 with your two whites is not a good look. I mean, just not great form, it seems. But I think Anish is making progress finally. I would play knight b5 here. And Oh, he goes king g4, which is super logical, just trying to actually advance mm -hmm. your king. h5 is hanging. Now knight f5 is a move to go after the d4 pawn. In fact, knight f5 just looks great for black. Anish is definitely going to win this game. Yes, I'm confident that he's winning it. So I will quickly have a look at the rest of the chess bros if I can find them. And if that game starts still going. Uh, actually, um, Maroon Toomp has won his game already on board four for the chess bra, so that's good news for the Brav fans. Whoa. He won. Ooh, the wow. final position is beautiful. Hey, Sam Copeland. Sam. <laughs> Hello, Sam. Yeah. Queen knight six. Sam, Maroon put his opponent in the tomb and went queen to h6 to finish this game off because if bishop takes queen, well, the maiden one is thrown on g7. If bishop takes queen, rook h6, and rook h8 is forced mate. So, unfortunately for Sarah Hult, is that, is that how you pronounce it? Holt? Holt? I think Holt. Sarah Holt. Gotcha. The two O's. Uh, confused me there, but the checkmate on H8. Sam Copeland, you listening? There he is. There he is. Sam, I've, I've summoned you from the dead because Maroon Tomb has got it going on. That's a great win. So, uh, ooh, Hansen about to lose. That pawn's about to promote from on B3. And the, Anish Giri's still going. This game reminds me of, like, one of, like, the world championship games between Magnus Carlsen and Fabiana Caruana. It's like, it's close between winning and drawing, but now the D4 pawn is gone on a, in this Geary game. I think it should be a much easier converting task. 
Indeed. Now for the Berlins, there's one more game that's important in this match, and that's another advantageous position. Actually, two pieces up for the Bear, Michael Basel against Nikolai Noritsin. Uh... That is. Wait a second, let's count. Yep. Um, the, the bras are winning on board one and board four, and losing on board two and board three. It's going to be 2 2. Yeah, Nikolai Norton lost the game down two pieces. I just pulled it up. But Anish Giri is trying to keep them in this. And okay, G2 is just collapsing in Giri's game. So he should be able to convert pretty soon. And who else is playing? I see two more games down there. Oh gosh, that's Volkovi. That is Nika Volkov. <laughs> Down to, Your best friend, Nika Volkov. He's down two pawns, but up 12 seconds. And it's going to be interesting to see. I, white should be able to win this quite easily. You put your queen on B, D4. That's the best square. And the queen on D4 protects F2. Or put it on F4, where it protects F2. Then push your A pawn. You have to be slow and methodical in, in an endgame like this. Okay, don't. what are you doing with your king? Career, <laughs> no, what are you doing? Don't make a draw. Okay, king H2. Put your king on H2. Play queen c5 play yeah there it is you gotta be play h5 maybe not now but you sometimes you want to play h5 do not flag five seconds left okay so I don't... it's collected some time that's good strategy get some extra time there's a two second increment so by making quick moves he managed to increase his time to 10 seconds that's a lot of time yep queen uh, queen no, uh, queen d4 check doesn't make the progress, but okay, he's just trying to f figure out a way to push this pawn. King... Maybe now bring the king and then try to place the queen on the fifth rank to push a5. So with patience, this position has to be winning for Chukavin. Um, the other game that's still going on is between Posny and Grigorians, the top board for the pawn grabbers versus board one of the wizards. And this is, well... Oof. Anything could happen if someone blunders, but for now, yeah. it's a rook hand game with a pawn up for Posny. Yeah, that's good. He should be careful about dropping the rook, we all know that. But <laughs> apart from that, he he should be one to try to win, but the h pawn drops. Isn't it dropping right now? Yeah, it's going to be a draw if the rook takes h4, just rook and pawn versus rook and pawn. But the other game, what has happened here? What has Chukavin done? Okay, oh. he, he's, he's done everything right. Oh, stalemate. Watch out for stalemate, stalemate. He took that G6 pawn. Queen G2. Queen G... Queen... Queen, G, queen H1, Queen H4. Um, yeah. He, he, oh, it's the set. Queen, queen G3. Queen G3. Sack that queen. Queen... King, G, king H5, Queen takes H4. Draw. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Chukavin. No. This is that Anish Giri meme, right? You know, Queen G7 checkmate, Queen G8 checkmate, Queen G6 <laughs> stalemate. Oh, look what he did. I moved... That's a brilliant meme, and your friend, Nika Volkov, saves the day for the gentleman in this round. Oh, what happened was on move 76, he took the pawn, thinking he was going up a third pawn. But what we didn't realize is he was just giving a stalemate opportunity for Nika Volkov. So he could have put h5 as white and just said, let's trade pawns, and I'll be up two pawns and win that way. Instead, he takes that pawn, and then it's just a draw because the queen sacrifices herself. Ah, painful. This is amazing. Impressive stuff by your friend Nika Volkov. Escapes from the draw, the draw of death. This was a game over situation, but eventually he managed to rescue it. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to pull up the uh, other scene here with all the bo individual board scores. And that is a, it might end up being a huge half point missed opportunity, but for now, the gentlemen are, well, they're in sort of the middle of the pack there. They have four points out of a possible eight, and it's the Dallas Destiny. We haven't actually tuned in on many of their games, so maybe next round we should look at that. The pawn grabbers are struggling on their top two boards, it seems. Okay, Posting just made this draw, so as soon as that gets updated, he'll have half a point. But Shabalov, 0 out of 2, and uh, that's obviously not great for the pawn grabbers. They uh, only have three points out of eight. Yeah, not a very good start. A shout out to Planet Chess Club. Thank you so much for the raid. We appreciate it. And great stream. Planet Chess Club was just streaming right before we started our broadcast. So we were tuning into that. I was in the chat, if you guys have noticed. Thank you so much for the raid, Planet Chess Club. Yep, thank you. And um, okay, Anna, anything surprising after two rounds here? You know, the Destiny are in first, Estonia in second. I think that's probably 
a bit of a surprise. Yeah, that's a surprisingly good start for the horses. As we mentioned, a couple of these teams are at the bottom of the standings, including the horses. So the horses, the turtles, and who else I was looking that he has, they have to perform right about the bears. The, those three teams are very unlikely to make it to the playoffs or even secure their spot for next year's Proches League. So as you know, the top four teams in each division will go through to the playoffs. But the bottom two teams, that's also important not to finish at the bottom of the standings because they will need to re-qualify for the 2020 Pro Chess League. They need to keep their position by finishing at least on the sixth place. So the bottom two will go down. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's got that relegation system. So those, those teams, Estonia, Turtles, the Bears, they're all trying to uh, fight claw their way back into a better standing because they do not want to have to qualify once again for this league. Ooh, okay, I know, I know which game we're going to look at. The game Tell me about where it. Where Anish spent a minute and a half on his first move because he wasn't at the board, and oh. he's, 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 play, <laughs> he's playing Jabawa. We should definitely focus on this game. Anish Giri, once again, making his debut in the Pro Chess League. Uh, there was quite a lot of joking around because of his debut, since Anish has been on the lineup of the Chess Bros for years, but he never played a single game. And today, finally, it's happening. Folks, it's happening. Anish Giri is here, but maybe he's not familiar with the system and he just wanted a bathroom break. Yeah, and Jabawa, what's he doing? Is he like saying, okay, he spotted me time, I'll spot him time back? You know, maybe Anish spends a minute and a half, so he'll spend three minutes, and they're just going to play some sort of funny time game here? I mean, this is... Could be, could be the case. So let's see if Badur Jabawa, being the gentleman he is, will make it exactly to 8.34 and then play his first move. Strange. Very strange. So... <laughs> I'm loving it. He's in his seat. And uh, that's what Greg is saying. We, they can see him. He's in his seat. Yeah. I think he's giving back the time to Anish, honestly. Well, I, actually, I just saw a game is over. So this game between Jan Elvis and Alex Sh Shabalov, they are longtime friends. Oh, um, yeah, they are very good friends, and they made a draw. Yeah. So even though they are not, they are not teammates, but they have been longtime friends, and friendship for a few players matters yep. i heard you talking about friendship and chess robert yep. the other day with alexandra so i know your thoughts on this <laughs> yeah it's you know, it's not easy playing friends that's for sure but uh you just have to get over it and do what's best for your team these two maybe feeling like the draw is best for the team shabov did lose his first two games so it's nice to get out of the donut i know you love donuts i love donuts i had apple pie for breakfast but, um, uh, you know, it's nice. I love donuts, but I love even more our bagels. I'm going to use some of the bagel emotes from chess.com in honor of my colleague, Robert Hess. Oh, I see them there. Yeah, so tasty. Even the emotes look so tasty. I could eat the emotes. Jabba was still not making a move. I think this is more than a gentleman move. I don't know what's happening to Jabba right now. Yeah, let's ask. Greg, can you update? Can you update us on what you see through the webcam? Yeah, what is going on here? I'm asking. Hopefully we get an answer. But let's go to a game that actually has moves being played because the other <laughs> games are full. Let's go to, oh, it's D5. It's a mind game. He oh, Jobaba has made a move. Headline news after two and a half minutes of thinking. He, <laughs> so Greg said he asked him and uh, Jabawa looked at the screen all confused. And so he probably didn't realize the game had started, even though all his teammates are also playing. So not oh. good awareness by Jabawa. For him you know, and his teammates, I hope that he will be able to pull off. An, you know, anything but a loss is an upset for Jabawa when you're playing the black piece against Anish Giri. Yeah, totally. And now Anish is thinking, so this is a game where both players are using <laughs> way too much time on the first move. Yeah. Let's move somewhere where there's actual... Um, there are actually moves being played, not at one move per two minutes rate. I pulled up Jeffrey Zhang's game because we said Dallas is in first place. We haven't mm -hmm. gotten to their matchups yet. And here, what it, Jeffrey Zhang's up two pawns. He could take a third pawn on E4, but Black is way ahead in development. Look at that white king side. From E1 to H1, your pieces haven't mm -hmm. left the back rank. Should I be brave and take on E4, or should I... I don't even see how I can develop. Yeah, I 
think normally I'm very famous for being a pawn grabber and I love having extra material, but here I would take black because I'm not confident about this king side on development and white's king not castling anytime soon unless it's castle queen side. Wow, if you castle queen side, you might get made it on that side of the board too. Yeah, I'm I'm not loving it. I would like to castle king side, but it's gonna take ages to develop all those pieces as you have said he's also going down on time okay so jeffrey strong starting not so well in terms of how confident he's feeling about this position that's my assumption yes because a move five black played this move g6 to g5 wow. which is i as I, i've someone who's played this opening as white many times this is not a typical plan and so he just sacrificed a pawn and said, I'm going to beat Jeffrey Zhang by, look at B5 on move eight, Sam Copeland. G5, B5, Sam, 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 G5 and B5. Sam Who Copeland. Who is this guy, Mikhail Tal? Yeah, what, what is going on here? Just sacrifice all his pawns. And if Black wins this game, Sam, I know you're listening, then this has to be a candidate for game of the week because Jeffrey Zhang is one of the strongest players on the planet. His 2651 next to his name there, that is underestimating his strength. His live rating is much higher because since then he did very well in the Isle of Man tournament, things like that. So, um, yeah, he's 2670 or something like that. Uh, and with the white pieces against Tom Jack here, I'd be so concerned. Knight d4 just speaks to me. Throw that knight into the game. <laughs> Totally, I'm loving that move and I'm still shocked by G5 and B5. What a game, we are back in the Romantic era. And if Black wins this game, for sure, this is going to be a game of the week candidate. Yep, yeah, this is for sure. Hey, Sam Copeland, I didn't know players not named Jabal were allowed to be so reckless with wing pawns. That's hilarious. <laughs> Great comment by Sam and shout out to all of you, by the way, beautiful people. 2,500 chess lovers from all over the world tuning into week seven of the Pro Chess League. It's very early for some of you and maybe very late for others, but we so appreciate that you are here hanging out with us. Absolutely, and it's winning for Black here. I'm not afraid to say it. Bishop to f5 threatens pawn to e3 and bishop c3 check. I think Jeffrey Zhang is losing a miniature here. I don't even see a move after bishop f5 to stop me from just winning the game. Oh, this is some unbelievable stuff here. Uh, Jeffrey. Totally. Let's get some hype, some poggers. I'm going to use my, my hype emotes, my Peter poggers. This is everything that we want to see in the Pro Chess League. What an amazing, inspiring game by Tom Chuck. Yeah, this is, wow. this is some crazy stuff. I, I, Bishop F5, just, what does White do? We keep talking about the development. How are you going to develop in this position? I'm not sure. You can't play E3. Because you play e3 for white if I gave you another move, bishop c3 check comes and you can't block the check. That's very important here. And right now, if I play bishop c3, you go bishop to d2, and you suggest, okay, like I'm still doing probably not very well because bishop f5 still is an option here for black, but why would I throw this check in first if I can play bishop f5 immediately and say, I'm challenging you to figure out what you're going to do as a means of meeting this move. I think it's terrible position for Jeffrey, unfortunately for Dallas Destiny fans. Yeah, a uh, very impressive play by Tom Chuck. We shall see if he will actually manage to convert it into a full point. It still takes finding the best, the very best moves. He can, I think, one mistake and he can slip. The advantage of black can disappear because it's such a concrete position. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, it's just no development, though, for white. So I, if anyone's watching here and you're like, my coach taught me to develop first, listen to your coach. And I'll, you know, usually listen to Jeffrey Zhang's moves as well. But right mm. now, I mean, Tom Jack is just taking it to him. is not afraid at all. Yeah, not afraid at all, for sure. Shall we have a look at his teammates, how the rest of the Destiny guys and girls are doing? Okay, so that's uh, Dretch. That's Conrad Holt with the black pieces against Arik Braun. We just saw Braun beat Eric Hansen in the second round of today's action. And here with the white pieces, he is down a pawn. He sacrificed a pawn, has the two bishops. But I love Black's position here. I, you know, I'm going to be greedy like you. You're influencing me, Anna. <laughs> I'm very happy to hear that. Just give me the material. I mean, how, how does, how can white have compensation for this pawn at this point? I don't see Grabbing it. some pawn, I'm going to use my pawn grabber remote. You're... And free stuff. I love free stuff. Oh, it actually 
Just to go back to this game for a second here, it looks like Tomczak missed his best opportunity because now I'm not worried. Mm -hmm. I like White's position now. Once that e4 pawn drops and I can play knight f3, e3, bishop d3, things like that, I just really like uh, White's position. So Sam Copeland, Sam, don't, <laughs> don't pick this game for game of the week, okay? We're going to go away from it now. But, uh, I mean, White's position just looks excellent because you can't even castle for black as the bishop on d7 is hanging. Bishop c3 check, I can always block on d2. So, yeah, this is... What a turn of events, and we are being told that we have completely missed the crucial moment in the game between Giri and Jabava. And is Giri up a piece? Whoa, 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 whoa. How did this happen? So I'm moving back to move 17 just to see. It looks like symmetrical, but white has two bishops. And... Traded. Ooh, he played knight takes d4, Jabava, on move 22, oh. thinking that he's winning a pawn, and he lost a piece. Oh, he thought that after pawn takes d4, bishop c1, he's going up a pawn. But if we don't take that knight, and that's a lesson to everybody, that you don't immediately have to take a piece, you're going to do an intermezzo. Bishop b2, and he simply won a piece because both knights were under attack initially, and Jabava sacrificed the wily knight, and it's just winning for Geary now, the the bishop is worth more than the two pawns in an endgame like this, and White will just go after the king's, excuse me, the queen side and win the game. Yikes. Yeah, I see that the chess brass have an emote for Anish Giri. That's great to see that for his debut, they created the Anish Giri emote. And as you guys realized from their Twitter, there's an Anish Giri sale going on with the promo code Anish. Uh, not 50%, though. Just 20. Just, just 20. 20. Yep. And um, Anish Giri going to score his third win, three out of three, by the debuting Chesbra. What about Eric Hansen, who started with zero out of two? Um, I just pulled up his game here. He's going to start with zero out of three. Be Ooh. Because he's down how many pawns? A million, and he has no time. Yeah, two pawns. The bishop on e8 is trapped. The c pawn is just rolling to promotion. The knight f2 is trapped. Not good minor pieces for black here. Um, I think for the sake of the chess bra fans, we might not want to look at this game anymore. C6, Yeah, C7. Uh, we need to switch. We love Eric. We love the chess bras. This is too painful to look at. Let's hope that Eric will manage to pull himself together for the remaining games. Yep. And I accidentally clicked on the Sicilian defense check over variation because that was on the game thing. It took me to a new window. So that's what I just closed out of real oh. quick. <laughs> My bad. My bad. Just, you know, sometimes got to check the opening, you know? Well, totally unintentionally. How about Volkovi, Nico Volkov? Uh, staying in this match. I saw Pawn go to d7, and I'm like, I gotta keep Ooh. here. Maroon Tomb is up a rook with the black pieces. W wait, so bishop takes b2? He's up a rook, and the bishop on b2 is hanging. So, so I... he can take the bishop. I like taking it, because I feel like white black's king is not doing so hot, and, you know, if I take on b2, and you get to take my rook, I take back. Now, all of a sudden, I'm up a piece, and my king is still vulnerable, but I, at worst, I'm making a draw here, right? And sometimes it's worth minimizing the risk. And if you play rook d8, maybe it's still just a draw, but I'm worried about queen d5 check, and queen takes h5, and things like that. It looks pretty scary. I, I totally. Um, we are being told that the Sean game is still really exciting. Okay. This is where we thought that Jeffrey was in trouble out of the opening, then Tom Chuck made a mistake. It still looks like Jeffrey is in the driver's seat, but he still hasn't finished development on the king's side. Yeah, but he can go, oh, it's Black's turn. Like, oh, he can go e3 now. I'm like, oh, wait a second, he can't, it's not his move. But he's going to go e3 or g3. He might even go g4 if he's feeling like Jabawa today and plays g4. Yeah, feeling like Jabawa. <laughs> Wait, what, can I take on b4 now? Can I just take all your pawns? Hmm. I'm greedy, you're I like turning- that free stuff, uh, free stuff. I'm gonna use some of the free stuff emotes again. You're turning pawn me grabbing. into a greedy chess player. And some bagels. So free stuff, pawns, bagels. Free bagels, who's, who's giving me free bagels? I would love to get some bagels yeah. right now, like right now. It would, it would be great. I would love some bagels. So, <laughs> yeah, this game is, I mean, Jeffrey just looks good here. I, I, there's still a lot that can happen. They both have only have three minutes and 20 seconds approximately, but all of a sudden I think White's play is speaking for itself. You're no longer, your king is no longer in danger. You're up two pawns, about to be three pawns, which you take on before. I don't like Black's position at all. 
Yeah, this is a pain. And it started so well for for Tom Chuck at G5 and B5, still really inspiring moves. But it wasn't such an easy position. So, of course, we can't claim that he missed an easy win. No, he played in a very inspiring style at the beginning, yeah. and then he didn't manage to find the best way to continue the attack. Absolutely. That's all that happened. Yeah, and I went back to this game between Toom and Volkov because I just want to see how this is happening with Nika Volkov and the White Pieces having six minutes and Maroon Toom having one. But I, I think Black has seen the worst and is now just going to be up a bishop. Once you take this rook on e8, I simply can take back with my queen. And um, mm -hmm. I think Black has very good winning chances because the white king is actually very weak over there on h2. I completely agree with you. So he's giving back the rook, but it's going to be a piece up. And it doesn't seem like white's going to have perpetual check. That's white's last hope that he can create uh, checks eternally. That is perpetual check so that the black king could not hide. I don't think it's the case. So that will be a win for the, the bras in this game. After Eric's third consecutive loss, I think this is a relief that they are winning on board four against one of the top board four. So Nika Volkov, we shall mention again that he's at 2100. That's his classical rating. But in Blitz, he's about 2500. Yeah, no, he's he's definitely a beast in the quicker time controls. So, yeah, but Tomb, got a great last name. I mean, just the best last name in the entire league. Maybe the entire yeah, world. Yeah, that's his real name. It's not a handle. It's his real name. Yeah. Tian Khan is saying, wait for another stalemate from Nika. You're right that Nika has produced some wizardry already on the board. Maybe we're going to witness something again, but it's unlikely. So King G8 was played. So I guess they're trying to make a draw now. I mean, you could have played King to E7. And I understand the reluctance to make the move King to E7. But I think that would be trying to play for a win, whereas king to g8 without queen g6, you have to go king back to f8 to protect your rook on e8, and they actually just made a draw by repetition. But if Maroon Tomb was feeling um, adventurous, he would have went king to e7, and that way, now my king is just attacking this pawn, so you can't keep giving me checks, but perhaps it's going to be a draw anyway with queen takes h5 check. I'm not sure. Um, I can understand after such a stressful game why you just let it peter out and say, let's just make a draw. A draw with black against a very good player is a good result, so um, hopefully my team uh, benefits from that. I'm a little bit shocked that it happened. So just when we claimed that black is not going to get into perpetual, if black decided he was not interested in taking a risk, what kind of risk, actually? Why did he not just go king e7? Yeah, I mean, it's... I guess king e7, he thought take on e8 and queen h5 check, but the worst that happens is you still make a draw, right? Because it's not like white can go scoop up all your pawns or anything like that, as bishop to e5 check is really deadly as this king on h2 is out of moves. So I would have played on, and at the worst, like I said, the worst, the absolute worst that happens is white makes some kind of perpetual check, which means you're going to make yeah. a draw anyway. I agree with you completely, Anna. This was, uh, I think, two, two, two of a fearless, not fearless, fearful move. I was going to say fearful, not fearless. Um, the complete opposite. I wonder what he was afraid of. Maybe he just looked at the time situation, one minute left and for the opponent five, but still there was nothing to lose in terms of the position for black. Yep. Yep. No, for sure. I, you just, you got to play on like this, but okay. Let's speaking of playing on, which game should we go to now? I wanted to check in with the turtles a little bit because they are also in a very tough situation. They need to finish at the top of the battle royale today if they want to have a chance of uh, saving this year's Proches League for them. Uh, Borishak against Dobrov is in an interesting position, I thought, if White has anything, but maybe White has just nothing. He's a piece down and he was trying to create some attack now. Rook F7 was a threat, but it was back to move. Okay, there's nothing. It's going to be either a queen trade or I move that queen e5 threatening queen h2. Yeah. Ugh, no, the wrong moment to tune into this game because the turtle, your favorite turtle, isn't he your favorite turtle, Donatello? Yes, Donatello is my favorite. I was trying to find the game. I was like clicking around. I'm like, where's Donatello? And I was, then finally <laughs> scrolled down and saw him. But yeah, Donatello, unfortunately, well, wait, didn't they just repeat a little bit? Oh, they have repeated once. Twice even. So, twice, yes. One more time, and it's a draw. Oh, Rook F7 check. Let's go, Donatello. Do it. Rook F7. Wait, Rook F7 and take the bishop, and then Queen F7 yes. check. 
He's... Dobrev has blundered. Oh, why do you know? And don't let the little blunders in the back. No, you gotta. Mid chance. You gotta be aggressive and then take this bishop and then give this check on f7 and win the rook. So missed opportunity. Dobrev is down to 20 seconds, and, but Donatello, aka Yura Borishek, has missed a big chance. Oh, that makes me sad. Oh, seeing your favorite turtle not doing well. Yeah, because I actually wore my Ninja Turtles t-shirt the other day when I did a stream with Aaron. And, uh, you know, whoa. Okay, can we just do, look at the, I can't even speak because I just scrolled over the board between Conrad Holt and I don't even remember who he was playing. But I think, <laughs> I mean, look at this position against Arik Braun. Look where Black's King ended up. Uh, let me find the game. So that's Baby Lax yep. against D Wretch. Yep. What? That's, Getting mated in the middle of the board. That's a checkmate. That king on D4 doesn't look very happy. And no. I mean, I, I don't even know what happened here. It looks like the queen got to F5 on move, um, or on move 26, where that king just in trouble for black because this pawn on h5 means g6 is hard to play as i'll always take it and as we see rook e3 was played on move 27 he just broke open this king and the king went on a, on a journey but it didn't get far enough because it's just checkmated on d4 ridiculous king of the hill got dethroned chess win this thing totally someone got confused about what game he's playing yep that's that's not good not good at all so where do we go? Sorry, I I'm just saw the checkmate and now my whole life is just feeling like it's <laughs> in shambles here. I just don't see kings on d4 like this so often. No, not often at all. I'm going to check in with some of the other Destiny players since we were uh, focusing on them this round. I see their last board, Tulin, Christopher Tulin against Sarah Holt. That's an interesting game. Ooh. Yeah, I just saw Jeffrey Zhang made a draw with uh, Tomchak. That game was wild, but uh, maybe a deserved result in the end where black was better, then white was better, then who knows what was happening here. Oh, it's a draw in the end. So that's I think that's a fair result in the game where it was ups and downs the whole time. Now, Sarah Holt, I think she's winning because she was under attack. Oh, Christopher almost flagged. Yeah. Ooh. But Bishop takes a6. How many pawns is white up? Four? Yeah, she's she's a million pawns up and the b7 possible mainly. That's the one that's going to win the game. She had to defend her king earlier on. That's why I thought it was an interesting game to follow. But no, then she handled it very well, protected everything, and now it's just a winning endgame. Yeah, she's up uh, the entire board pretty much. But she, you know, Promoting it... now and there's just a check knight of three. Oh. Whoa, she gives up the queen. She... Queen takes purpose, E3. I believe. Um, Wait, was it Queen takes E3? <laughs> what just happened? She gave up her queen to promote the B-pawn. Oh, Queen C5 check. Trade the queens off. Yeah, trade the queen. No! Uh oh she's not going to win. Queen F6. She's not going to win. You know, it just feels like a very nervous situation. She has so much time. Why didn't she spend it? Yeah, I don't know. I'm telling you, she's not going to win. She should play Queen D8 to D3, I think. <laughs> Throw the check on d8, put your queen on d3, protect your king, because knight f3 is a deadly threat for black, because you're going to try to check me on the g1 square. And that's the problem when you only have a bishop against a knight, is that you feel really unsafe on the opposing squares, or the dark squares. Wait, what? It's six seconds left What's for she doing? Sarah. She has to make a move. Uh-oh. Knight takes g2. Oh knight takes g2 is oh. immediately a draw. Missed, that was a missed opportunity for black. And now here comes the second b-pawn. Is Black playing for a win already? Just looking at the time situation? No, but he, he has to realize that he can still lose this game because of the queen side pass pawns of white. Here come the, the pawns. He Knight. wants to play queen h4 and trick her. Queen, queen g1. Threatening mate. Queen g1. Only move. We don't lose in time. No, she lost in time. Anna. She flagged. No. She fled. Look, Christopher was very smart to continue. I think he realized that Sarah was extremely nervous and she just flagged. If Christopher had repeated moves, <sighs> yes, he would have saved the end game, but now he got the full point. <sighs> wow. Oh. Wow. Oh. oh, come on. And you know what's amazing to me? You know, just like 
I knew it was going to happen. And I feel like bad. You called it. You called it. You called that she was not going to win. It was difficult to predict that she was even about to lose the game uh, with uh, three pawns up and the pass pawn that was a queen. Actually, after, yeah, can we just go back to the moment? I know normally we don't have time to look at post-mortem, but why did she take on h4 instead of promoting immediately? What's happening in that position, like b8 queen? Yeah, b8 equals queen looks very good. The queen on f2 protects the king. The new queen on b8 just is an extra queen. That was... She probably just saw pieces around her king and got scared, honestly. She was seeing ghosts. And yeah. b8 equals queen was completely winning. There's no way to checkmate with his queen on f2 and everything protected. But as soon as she went um, queen h4, you were right. You were like, wait, what's she doing? Because now the knight came in, took the queen. Then she lost the knight. And then she missed queen c5 check on move 52, which is offers yeah. a queen trade and whites up how many pawns? Three? So that would have been the totally. easiest way. And that's the thing is like when you're scared... And she had 34 seconds. So actually, I don't know why she didn't think a little more before playing. Hmm. She spent four seconds to take on h4. And that's, you know, that's bad clock management. You got to play, just think, spend your time now, because then she got herself in trouble. And she spent all this time here only after she went queen f6 check because she realized her position might not be as good as it used to be. And then she spent... Hmm. 30 seconds. She could have used that time earlier so that she would have mm -hmm. secured victory. And then after this, it still was winning. And even in the end, after queen e5, she had six seconds left. She couldn't find queen g1 quickly enough. And that's why she lost some time. And queen g1 is the defensive resource needed to win this game. Uh, this is incredible. It happened to Lin managing to get the full point. So he was rewarded for his fighting spirit. And Sarah, well, I hope that she will manage to bounce back because psychologically, this is a really tough game to deal with, forget about it, and just focus on the remaining rounds. Yeah, hard to forget about games like that. I mean, especially considering that she's half out of three now. She would have went to one and a half, but um, yeah. she's down there in the bottom of her score group. But okay, there's still four rounds left to play, and Dallas is still in first. They had an interesting round with Conrad Hall getting checkmate in the center of the board, with Jeffrey Zhang having that really topsy-turvy battle, and Christopher Tool in there winning. So that's some fortune for the destiny. And all right, what do you what do you make now? So we're three rounds in. Estonia still in second place. Dallas yeah. still in first. Do you see any of these teams in the bottom half making a comeback? Well, I'm hoping for all the fans of the Chess Bras that uh, since they have Anish Giri on three out of three, all that the Bras need to do is to start scoring on the remaining three boards. Like, that's all. Eric Hansen started with zero out of three. And we all know that he's capable of a lot more than that. So uh, I think if Eric starts scoring and his teammates pull themselves together too, then the chess bras can definitely make a good battle royale. But it it is now up to Eric if he can just forget about this bad start and be the strong chess bra he usually is. Yep. No, I completely agree because 0 out of 3, well, that's just unusual. I know sometimes Eric struggles, um, but he needs to not go on tilt, right? And Anish Giri is leading the way, but you can't just rely on Anish to win all the games. That's actually the, a, a larger question, Anna, is in this league, right? Let's let me pull up some of these graphics here, right? Just the how this league works in, in general, um, you have teams of four players, right? So let's pull mm -hmm. this up here. Yeah. And we also have teams from five continents. So we're very, it's a very global yeah. league, 32 teams. And uh, we'll pull up the standing soon. But the point is you have a four-team board, board. Ooh, four team boards, four board team. That's what I want to say. And yes. your, ma your maximum rating can be 2,500. Mm -hmm. So when you stack your team with Anish Giri on board one, he's almost 2,800. And it counts as 2,700 for league purposes. But... You need to make sure that your lower boards are doing well. Eric Hansen is not is board two and a very strong grandmaster, so you don't expect him to be the one struggling, and yet it's he's the one with O out of three. So, um, in general, do you feel better about the evenly stacked teams or um, just high rated boards one and two and lower rated boards three and four? I think this is a good question and. I believe it might be different for Battle Royale than to the regular matches because on a normal Pro Chess League week, we would see 
a team versus another team. Everyone plays everyone. So a board one will play board four, board three, board two, and then board one of the other team. Now in a battle royale, I don't think, in my personal opinion, that it's so easy for the teams that have a very similar strength on all four boards. So there are teams that have 2,600 GMs on top boards so that they can have a stronger board four. But that would mean that in a battle royale, their board one and board two would have a very difficult matchup against almost everybody else because they are only playing against board ones and board twos. Right, very true. Very, very true. And okay, we have games back underway. And speaking of boards ones and board twos, which board should we go to? Let's start with Anish Giri as usual, and then we'll look at the rest. Anish Giri making his debut today. That's why we are so hyped. Is he playing every single game with the black pieces? Again, it's Anish Giri with the black pieces. <laughs> they don't want to give him white. It's not fair. But he did just win that game over Jabal with the white pieces when Jabal was yeah. slipped up. But we have seen now his third black game of the first four against Evgeny Postny, very strong Israeli Grandmaster. Black has the two bishops here. White has the pawn minority attack in the Carlsbad structure on the queen side. Anna, what's your comfort level with either side of this position? Like, how do you feel in positions like this? Um, I'm usually comfortable on the black side, although I don't get more than just equalizing. I think black is okay for like a, a simple equal position, but it's not so easy to get more than that if you want to play this for a win as black. That's usually my impression on this position. Yeah, I'm totally with you. And if white is trying to play for more, that's also difficult as well, because as you just mentioned, black's plan is very simple. You want to play bishop e6, knight d7, maybe throw this rook on f8 to c8 to meet b5 with even a potential c5. So that's really mm -hmm. the question. If white plays b5, does black you know, either trade once on b5 and essentially try to play c5, and that way you can try to open this bishop on g7, which has been blockaded by this pawn, and the question really becomes, it centers around, is this sort of transition good for white or is it good for black? Yeah, that's always the question. And when is the right <coughs> moment Ooh. to push B5? I sneezed. Bless you. Was that, was that a, that was a sneeze, sneeze yes. by Mr. Hess? I sneezed on my truth. I thought I was the one who has allergy. Ooh. I, I'm, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I, I, I was going to make a joke about being allergic to something, but I'm really not allergic to anything. I think You're I'm allergic just... to me. No. Oh, come on. Don't say that. That, that hurts. That hurts, Anna. You know that's not true. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to take us off camera real quick because you know, we're both, we're both going to cry. So I'm going to pull up you know, the format scene again. Oh, no. It hurts. It hurts us both so bad. It hurts. So bad. No. Okay, we're back. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting, Anna. I was going <laughs> to mention that Anisha's move 15, rook f to e8. Mm -hmm. I was thinking maybe play it for f5 because you were saying it's hard to play for a win for black, and I agree. But f5 is one of those moves where you're like, I'm just going to go play f5. I'm going to try to play f4 and say, you know what? I am going to play for more than just equality. Yeah. And currently he has played a5 on the queen side, which also makes sense because it's forcing issues. And if b5 is the move of white, oftentimes what we're going to see is a trade on b5 and black has an a passed pawn. Right, it's very true, right? If you play takes, takes, this A pawn is roaming a bit free there. So instead, we've seen other things happen. They're moving quickly. Take on B4, trade queens, and now the A pawn is a weakness, I'd call it. But if white can get two moves and play A5, A6, then white's the one who's very happy as you're undermining the protection of the pawn on C6. But that's a very long story here for white as, well, immediately knight B6 just attacks that pawn. In fact, a very typical plan for black is to play knight b6, knight c4 anyway. And you don't care about getting double pawns because uh, if you end up being captured on c4, you have a pass pawn and you have the two bishops. Yeah, I love the move knight b6 and I can't really figure out what's the way for white to deal with it because if rook a1, uh, that steps into some tactics. Aren't there tactics on the long diagonal oh. with the c3 knight hanging? Yeah, c5, that looks really nice. Look at you. You're, aren't, you, I mean, <laughs> aren't you supposed to be Miss Strategy? 
No, well, his wife, his wife is influencing me in the right way. So his wife, Miss Tactics, Sofika Guramish, really, I spend way too much time with Sofika, and that's why I started to see more tactics in positions. That's my explanation. Yeah, well, I think, you know, working is you being Miss Strategy, with Sofika being Miss Tactics, somehow maybe you two are merging, like you're becoming yeah. good at both. And we are becoming just a monster with two heads. <laughs> I don't. I want to say a monster. Um, what's, what's like a much more applicable term here? Um, I don't know. Monster's just too evil. You're like the nicest people ever. So I, I can't accept. Oh, thank monster. you so much. Thank <laughs> you. I, I do miss miss tactics. Oh. Night B six is a beautiful move, and I think that Anish is about to score his fourth win. It's still, of course, nowhere near uh, converting it into a full point, but looking very promising for Anish Giri. Yeah, Anish is doing work in his Battle Royale and his Pro Chess League debut. It just, I don't know, it's somehow these Super GNs make it look so easy. And I'm like, oh, I play people like post knee and players around my rating are a little bit higher. I'm like, okay, like it's a real tough game. I have to really work just to get an advantage. And Anish is just making moves and getting good positions. So uh, part of it honestly could be like people fearing him because he's so strong mm -hmm. they want to take it a little bit yeah. safer but honestly when you take it safe you often get yourself in a worse position because um, indeed you take like Posny. Posny yeah. was on the safe side uh, of this Cosba structure and then it just collapsed in in one moment everything went wrong now you asked me at the beginning of the broadcast Robert what was my prediction about Anish how many points he would score and I was joking he was gonna go seven out of seven now I regret that it was partially a joke by me because he is about to do it. Yeah, he really might. I mean, it's just his position has been excellent. Here, the move uh, bishop f5 is just the immediate move that comes to mind, uh, attacking this knight on c2. But you said five and a half, I said six. Maybe we both underestimated him. And he's just yeah. really just dispatching all of these good players and making it look very easy. Bishop f5, I think you have to go bishop d3 for white as a response. But then I'm thinking, do I take on d4 and give you an isolated pawn? That looks pretty promising. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there might be back rank issues as well. So I won't go through the whole line, but like let's say there's knight d4, bishop d4, take, bishop d3, rook d3, and maybe I can even play knight takes a4 there as rook e1 checkmate looms in case of a double capture on the a file. So that was a very long line, but it just goes to show that bishop f5 has hidden tactics thanks to the white king not having Luft and space for the king. So rook c8 was played instead. Okay, that's a very logical move, maybe even better. But um, yeah, that, that. Yeah, look at these hanging knights on the c file. This is about to collapse for white. He plays rook a3 to protect the c3 knight in case of c takes d4. But I'm, I'm suspecting that this defense cannot hold. It just looks too shaky. Yeah, bishop f8 is a move that comes to mind as well, saying, What's your rook doing on a3? Oh, totally. I love Bishop F8. Shout out to the captain of the Armenia Eagles. I've just realized that he is here with us, Artak Manukian, the defending champions of the Pro Chess League, and they are on their way to qualify for the playoffs and make history again. So certainly the Armenia Eagles are one of the top guns in the Pro Chess League, current top team of the Eastern Division. Yeah, no, the Armenia Eagles are phenomenal. And shout out to Artak Manukian. Didn't even see him here, but yeah, they're a great force. The reigning champions of the Pro Chess League. And as I pull up the standings real quick before we get back to the action, just to show how well they're doing once more because they just it feels like you can't stop them, right? The Armenian Eagles at second place in the Eastern Division, just behind the gentlemen. So you know that the Eagles are rooting against Tbilisi here in <laughs> the Battle Royale because they want to leapfrog them in the standings. Yeah, and as we pointed out, the score that the Eagles have collected is impressive, 131 and a half after six weeks. So this is without the Battle Royale. Uh, 131 and a half would be first spot in any other division, yep. but the Eastern. Yep, they um, they're uh, enjoying life. Honestly, you know, it's just it's kind of like oh, too bad you're just so good, but you're only in second place because another team is just even better right now. But a lot of other teams are definitely jealous of their performance. Certainly. 
And now uh, Artak is saying hi to you, Robert. We love the Armini Eagles. We are totally unbiased. They have given us lots of cool styles, like we have their art t-shirts, our mugs, and a very fine drink from Armenia with our faces on the bottle. So yeah, we are totally unbiased when we talk about the Eagles. Yeah, for sure. And then Anish Giri, Bishop of Fate, Rook B3 played. Uh, Knight takes A4. This is just looking like Anish is... I mean, he's just too good for his opponents. That's really what this is. A C pawn is about to go to C4. If you take, uh oh, uh oh, I was about to say, if you take on C5, something looks wrong here, but D4 is one option. Attacking the rook, hmm. maybe just rook takes C5. I guess what White's hoping for is a blockade by putting this knight on D4 and saying, I'll be down a pawn for the time being, but maybe I'll be able to hold in the long run. I don't know. Yeah, uh, while this game is being played, I will quickly have a look at Eric. Um, the main chess bra usually started struggling. He lost all three games so far. It's crucial if he can bounce back with a win against Alexander Shabalov. Yeah, and Shabalov lost the first two before making a friendly draw against Jan Elvis. So it's not like he's having a good tournament either. And I like Eric's position with the white piece. I love having two bishops. Oh, me too. So this is clearly the moment when Eric can bounce back. And as Robert pointed out, Shabalov started poorly as well. So both of them are wounded. And that's a good moment for one of them to at least gather some confidence by winning this game. Yeah. Uh, and the question is how, though? Because if you trade queens, I don't really love your chances to win. If you move the queen, I traded. I, I didn't think that would happen. Hmm. Oh, I also expected Eric to keep the queens on the board because now this is looking more of an equal position. Pair of bishops, which is always good news. But... Uh, Don't blunder. Rook takes b2, just to show everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A move like rook ch check comes on the board, and you're not going to be very happy with the consequences because if you play bishop of eight, then my bishop comes to h6, and I'm going to take your knight on uh, e6, and your bishop on f8 is pinned. So that's a painful situation to see happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so instead of that move, he shall look for something else. Um, I wonder what shall that be, though. Maybe it's not such an easy position. He plays bishop to f6 to create some space for the king, and now he wants to take the pawn on b2. But this gives time for Eric to simply push it to b3, protect it. And I think he's comfortable in this endgame. So this could be a good game for Eric Hansen advantage because of the pair of bishops and the b post pawn on the remaining boards between the bras and the grabbers uh gm county against game over bro i love that handle by the way game over bro at <laughs> maroon tomb yep and maroon tomb has the white pieces here and black is the side that looks better to me because of this very nice pawn structure e6 d5 configuration mm -hmm. limits the bishop on g2 the bishop on b4 protects c3 but it's a very awkward piece it doesn't like have anywhere to work with and okay queen d3 to protect the c3 pawn don't be fooled you can take this mm -hmm. pawn on c3 but then rook c1 happens and this pin can be a bit annoying to deal with so don't just don't be a pawn grabber even if you're on the team if you are a pawn grabber yeah black has d4 to protect the c3 bishop so he wouldn't lose the piece but i agree with you that it looking up this looks a bit fishy yeah take there but in any case, I also like Black's position. And on the last board, that's, uh, well, on the remaining words, this is, this is board four and their board three. Uh, Nikolai Noritsin for the chess bras playing with the black pieces against Tuan Minlie. That's an exciting position. Yeah, I like Black's position at first glance because if these bishops get traded in the long diagonal, I'm worried about White's king. So you can take on c5 with either piece took with the rook, that makes sense to keep this pawn structure, a7, b6, so that's one pawn island where you see isolated pawns in a4 and c4, so that's a, an opportunity for black. I would take on b7 with the knight, and mm -hmm. then try to put my knight on a5 or c5 and attack your remaining pawns over here. And he's listening to you, so he plays knight takes b7, e4. I think that's normally a good idea to break through in the center, but it also is a pawn sacrifice. f takes e4 opens the fifth rank for the rook rook h5 could come in the future so i'm not sure that this was such a good idea by white actually yeah i love your idea with rook coming to h or knight d6 
just to protect the pawn. If you go queen h6, maybe I go king f7, rook h5, rook h8. Yeah. Put the totally. I love it. I love the idea. Rook h5 or king f7, the combination of those two moves. Uh, it's not a good trade for white to give up the e pawn for the h pawn when that opens up the h file against his own king. And is your queen getting trapped if you go queen g6 check? Like, can I just go king h8 and then rook g8 if your queen's here? Yes. Yikes. Oh, this is looking painful for Tuan Menle. Um, I think Noritzin is on his way to win this game. And Eric, I just quickly go back to his game to see if he has made a progress. Still an advantage is end game, but it's nowhere near winning it. Anish Giri with the black pieces against Posny. That is a pawn up end game. Yeah, that's a great pawn now, because now white is left an isolated pawn, which means that's going to require some serious defense. And it's a past extra B pawn, and the bishop on C8 looks like it's passive, but you can just centralize your king, continue to pressure the D pawn, maybe put your rooks in the second rank to a rook A2, and then follow with rook C2 and go after this pawn on eight, uh, excuse me, on F2. Yeah, it just seems like it's very easy for black to play. And even if I lose B7, your D4 pawn is probably going to be lost as well. So um, looks like a very good winning chance here for Anish Giri. Yeah, I think the chess bras are going to win in this round. So I, I'm turning my attention to some of the other board one games. Lexi Sexy is on the defensive side, is he? There's some bishop takes h6 Whoa. that his opponent Tomchak has played. Whoa. Okay, so bishop h6, opening up a discovery on the rook on e7, and saying if we trade rooks, your knight on c7 at the end will be hanging. So Jabal goes knight e6. I love that decision because your knight is actually better than the bishop in this position since the bishop doesn't really have a useful diagonal to work with. You can sit on d6 all you want. I'll simply move my rook away and ask you what you're doing there. So, um, okay, so he took that pawn first. Looks normal. Rook to a7. I like black. But yeah, I, I think uh, now <laughs> I like black. For a moment, I was not, like, what is this bishop h6? But... Le Lexi Sexy, aka Badur Jababa, didn't care about it. And now with the centralized queen, double rooks on the a5, and this e6 knight that is controlling lots of crucial squares, I also think that he's doing well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if now things can be a little bit iffy if you know the king goes to g7 and that you get the h6 square to use, but there's no reason that black should ever allow that. Rook h4 check, king g7. And if you ever put your queen on c1, I can always go queen g5 to block that diagonal. I just need to make sure you're not getting your pieces on the H file either. Like if that rook on F1 could somehow be on H7, well, I'm just delivering a checkmate mm -hmm. right away. But that's a long story. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Now, as for the match that we were discussing earlier, uh, the chess bras against the pawn grabbers, it's important for both teams almost equally. They are both in the Atlantic division on spots that are not about to be relegated, but neither to qualify for the playoffs. So the chess bras and the pawn grabbers currently on the fifth and sixth place. And that means that they both want to get into the top four of the Atlantic division. And they are currently facing each other with the bras doing better in the match. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's a necessity here. And the destiny continue to win. I mean, I. I I don't even know how it's possible. Like They're going under the radar a little bit, but let's go to Jeffrey Zhang's game because I see that's quite interesting as well, and the Destiny are in first place. But Jeffrey with the white pieces, we saw him draw a game earlier against Tomchek that was absolutely crazy. Here with the white pieces, I don't know who's better and why because um, <laughs> even material, but there's a pawn on c5, d5. It looks like it's about to be a passed pawn, but the king on g3 is a little bit unsafe. Anna, how do you evaluate this position? Uh, I would say this is a very complicated position. Double-edged. You're such a smart chess player and just a smart person because that's such a good answer, right? We always say it's interesting. It's complicated. Double-edged. Dynamic. Chances for both sides. Um, you know, it's, you got to take risks. Any result is possible. <laughs> you have to take risks to make progress here. And in taking those risks, you might be on the worst side of the position. So Indeed. I love it. I love it. I, I, I really don't know who's better, so these all are like serious responses. Uh, I, okay, let, let's try to evaluate. What, we, what, are, what do we like and dislike about the position? What I like from White's point of view is my c5, d5 configuration, mm -hmm. and the fact that, that pawn on b3 feels like in a king and pawn end game will be an easy target. Mm -hmm. 
or in a minor piece endgame. That's what I like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also love the fact that White is about to create a pass pawn. At the same time, there are tactical motives because of this rook on f4. Now White is about to trade the rooks. I think it's a good idea, rook c4. Yep. But it allows the trade and then c takes d5, bishop takes, knight takes, rook takes. What's going on there? The a4 pawn is in the air. Or if he doesn't take on d5, then he can take on f5. Right. But no, that steps into something it feels like. If he takes on f5, maybe... Hmm. I, guess... I was wondering if there's some tactical element because of the pieces hanging on the f-file, also the f7 pawn is vulnerable, but I don't see a way. Yeah, the... draw by agreement? No! Okay, this is... What? This is... I'm not happy about this. I really believe that Here? draw by agreement should more or less be banished. I said this during the World Championship when Magnus and Fabiano <laughs> agreed on that draw in the last round. I don't mind draws in chess. That's not it. As a chess player, yeah. I understand draws are part of the game, but... Why in the world is this position to draw? If it's rook against rook, okay, make a draw. I know that's a draw. Here, ah. Uh, what on earth uh, is a draw for after it takes d5? Jeffrey, maybe he felt like the game was slipping out of his hands. He was comfortable earlier, but not anymore. Uh, but it's clearly not a position where normally a draw would be agreed. Yeah, I have no words. We're gonna have to change the game because you know I'm a big fan of Jeffrey. Um, he's a great guy and he's an incredible player, and Gregorian similarly is a very good player, but why? Just play it out. If it's going to be a draw, it's going to be a draw, or one of you is going to win. So be it. I understand like the psychological ploy of, oh, I feel like I have a bad position, so let me just offer a draw, but no. Yeah. Okay, a lot of games have not that much time, so I see game over bro versus Canty. That one looks interesting because we're getting an end game with a two-pawn lead for white, but an extra piece for black. And yeah, let me catch up with you. And also, in the meantime, I saw a question in the chat about the Moscow Phoenix. But Greg Shahadi, Pro State Commissioner, has already explained it to you guys that they forfeited the matches and got zero points because they confused the dates. They thought that they would be playing today and not on Tuesday, which is really unfortunate. Yep. But it happened to them, so they got zero points. Yep, and the, honestly, I believe they have no one to blame but themselves. I mean, it's a manager's responsibility to look up when the games are. And you may have yes. a typical schedule, but sometimes things change, so you should really be on top of that. And it's very unfortunate because nobody likes to see forfeits. We all want to see games being played out and not having draw offers. <clears throat> but, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it is... It first, is. just show up at the board. That's... Just like at a classical tournament, you need to know when the rounds are. Some of the rounds start in the morning. There are double rounds. You need to be aware of the schedule. And it's not the task of the organizer or the arbiter to keep reminding you when is the round. Right. Um, so this endgame will go on for a while as well. And I think we should go over the Geary endgame because um, I, I can see a checkmate happening potentially in a few moves here. As the checkmate I'm seeing is rook to h1 followed by pawn to h4. Now that black mm -hmm. has won that pawn and okay so here how do we do this checkmate bishop d7 first probably just to stop rook b5 check okay bishop d3 similar premise yeah oh i like bishop d3 because it protects the pawn on g6 still and that's nice you save the check on d5 in case of rook f6 you protect the g pawn i like that flexibility here okay rook h1 will just deliver checkmate Yes, threatening h4 immediately. Yeah. So white has to move the bishop away to create some space for the king. He gives a check, but that only brings the black king closer. It does close the fourth rank for now, but I don't think that's a problem. h4 check still looks like a promising move. Or he can wait one move with it. Rook, rook the only c4. Thing is, he's going down on the clock 17 seconds for Anish gear. He plays rook c4. He's listening to me. Rooks, yeah, yeah, he doesn't have to give H4. check. H4. H4, H4 and the king c3, discover check, winning the rook. Yep, H4 check wins. 11 seconds, and he has played it. In fact, it's probably just checkmate as well. I mean, or king c3, if you go king e3, then you even have d4 check there, and you win a rook, so. Beautiful. Yeah, here it goes. A rookie one check probably wins even quicker, because you have to block on e2, and then rookie four check Ooh, comes. Ooh, mate, yeah. almost mate. Winning everything that's on the board. Uh, look at this rookie four check, and then bishop takes e2. Beautiful. Mate after bishop takes e2. Sam Copeland. Sam. Sam. Sam, <laughs> we need you. You hear us? This... Anish Giri scoring yet another win. Is this 
I'm already losing track. He has won four out of four or five out of five already. Five out of, no, four out of four. Four, four, right? It feels like we've counted this victory already, but now it's now it's actually written in the books. Four out of four by the top chess bro. Yep. Anish Giri and Eric Hansen won his game, by the way. So that's a good look for sure for um, the chess bros in this round. And Noritsin is probably going to make a draw in this game against uh, Tuan Min Lee of the Pawn Grabbers. So that would be two and a half points out of three in those matchups for the chess bros. And I don't know where how or how their board four did. That he lost. So Canty won for the Pawn Grabbers, which means this round will be two and a half, one and a half in favor of the Chess Bras, unless somehow White wins this game because that G Pawn is very past. And so, but no, okay, G6, the easiest. Wait a second. How are you stopping that G Pawn? Uh, good question. He's giving up the E Pawn to stop. No, no, G7 it. though. G7 here. Ooh, yes. Oh no. E1, Rook takes, Rook takes, and G8. Oh no. That's it. Okay, this is actually not that easy to win if you don't know how to do it, but it's much easier to win than it is to draw because the queen would always keep an eye on this rook and you have 14 seconds left. No, this is a uh, commentator's curse, right? I said Naritsin was going to draw this game, and of course now he just totally botches it. Both players have only 15 seconds left. It's a really exciting end to witness, but as Robert mentioned, way easier to play as white. You can barely drop the queen, barely, yeah, this is... or step into stalemate. Way more opportunities for black to lose his rook. This is painful. And it's a winning position, so even without being down on the clock, queen versus rook wins if you don't step into a trap or give stalemate. Yep, and Okay, queen, yeah, the checks will win the rook. The rook's very far away, which means that the rook is going down. Queen a7, yeah. queen b7. Nice. Next move, queen b7. That's it. Yikes. No, I mean... Wow, let's turn go. of events, turn of events. I mean... And that means... Can we go to move 74 <laughs> in this game? Like, how he lost this position from move 75 is... Like, even if you lose your e-pawn, you often can still make a draw. But what happened was he just let that pawn go too far. I mean, that's just the yeah. simple truth. And now this is 2-2. Two, two. So the pawn grabbers have, have come back in this match. And they managed to tie the score, which is an impressive result after seeing the positions they had. Yep. And, and I see the, the fatal error um, on, on move 79. Black went, Black went rook f1 check. And the reason yes. he went rook f1 check is he was worried that let's say he plays king to d5, rook takes e some kind of rook takes e3. The problem mm -hmm. is rook e3 is immediately a draw because your pawn's on g4 and my king just gets the yeah. opposition and I simply put my king in front of the g pawn. So yes, indeed. he should have left his rook uh, around here and played a move like, I mean, even king d7 is just fine because the rook has to come back to e4. You still can't trade on e3, but... Yeah, just a missed opportunity. And it's not the easiest endgame, I'm going to be honest, because your king's cut off. But um, mm -hmm. you just want to keep your rook on e1 so your rook can go to g1 anytime that pawn pushes. That's really the essential thing. And, um, yeah. yeah, that was a sad ending to this game. Very sad. I yeah, totally. But a great comeback by the pawn grabbers. All the games from round four have finished, which means that we have three more rounds to go. And as for the standings... I'm still worried about the Turtles mainly because they are not doing well and they badly need a great Battle Royale to save their team. They were among the top four teams in the previous Pro Chess League. So they were in San Francisco on site to play the finals of the Pro Chess League and now they may not, not just they are not making it to the playoffs, but they might relegate if they don't do well today. Yeah, yeah, they, um, they do not want to get relegated and I mean... I still can't get over this loss, honestly, just from from the position. It felt like black should hold easily, and this is sort of the type of day the chess bros are having, it feels like. I mean, Anish Giri wins, Eric Hansen struggling, and Noritsen just can't find his form. So let's pull up... Um, yeah. I have the individual scoreboards. Let's do that, just to see how everyone is doing. So Dow's Destiny, Estonia Horses are kind of pulling away from the third-place team here. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, the two doing very well. Good news for the horses as they are at the moment the bottom team in the Eastern Division and with a victory or a top spot in the Battle Royale, they can actually bounce uh, up to the middle of the standings. So they, there's a lot more point up for grab in Battle Royales. You should remember that. That's why it's so crucial that the teams who haven't been doing very well, if they can do it today, just today, it would already shake up the standings. As for the teams that are about to qualify for the playoffs, they should also keep their positions. Yep, absolutely. So, um, okay, this match is between... Ooh, the Destiny and the Horses we should definitely stay on this match because it's for first place. Estonia Horses in second, Destiny in first. So, thankfully, the first games that popped up were the ones we really want to look at here. Yay, this is the match we're going to be focusing on. And shout out to all of you, dear people, over 4... 1130 of you tuning in to the Protest League. This is a week seven. Robert Hess and I are commentating on the first group of the Battle Royale of today, but there will be a second one with Alexandra Botes and Danny Ranch. So don't go anywhere after our group is done. This is, uh, what is it? The fifth round? I'm so bad at maths. Yes. Three more rounds. Yes. <laughs> fifth round. <laughs> fifth round. So, it, you know, we have three games left. The, this one underway and two after this. Uh, we've been struggling counting pieces, knowing how many rounds are left. But we do know that this is for first place because Dallas Destiny, here we see Andre Gorovitz of the Destiny playing Tuan Berg of the Horses. So we'll keep our attention on this top ma uh, matchup here. And, well, speaking of math, the Estonia Horses, they – you know, this is their chance, right? If they just think about what's going to happen in the next few rounds, they can't trust anybody else to stop the destiny. They have to do it themselves. And we see Jeffrey Zhang playing the black side of this position against Nikita Meshkovs. And Meshkovs has not had an easy day at the office. He's played, mm -hmm. he lost in the first two games we saw to Anish Giri, to Badur Jabawa. Okay, those are amazing players, but so is Jeffrey Zhang. So it's not really getting easier despite, you know, having played already at 2,800 and, you know, Jabawa, who at any point can beat anyone in the world. Yeah, so far he's all right. But of course, we are just witnessing the opening moves. It's an English opening where White is very solid. So I would suggest we briefly look at the openings on all four boards and then decide which one will be the most exciting middle game. Because for now, Meshkos and Zhong, that's a safe and sound position for White. But it can be more exciting in the middle game. Yep. yep. Elvis with the black pieces against Conrad Holt that has also just kicked out. Uh, an old Indian defense. Well, y Jan Elvis with the black pieces. Uh, he's a veteran for sure. And here, <laughs> okay, the move that comes to my mind immediately is exactly C6. I don't want to allow a pony into D5. That then becomes a unicorn. And so I just want to keep knights out of the center. The pawn on D6 now feels a little bit weaker because instead of having a pawn protect it, we just push mm -hmm. our pawn forward. And that leaves the square next to it, the pawns, uh, a bit weaker. However, how do you get to this pawn on d6? You have two minor pieces in the d file, which means you need to move your bishop and move your knight just to put pressure with the queen. So I think for the time being, d6 is fine. You can play rook e8 to apply pressure on the e pawn. And that's the thing when you don't have a symmetrical pawn structure, right? When black lost an e pawn, but anytime you lose a pawn, you gain an open file. White lost a d pawn, well, traded it. White gained an open D file for their heavy pieces. So just something that you should always keep in mind when you trade off pawns and make it an asymmetrical pawn structure. Yeah, totally. I would say exactly the same. Robert Hess sums up every middle game position just as it is. Textbook guys make some notes whenever Robert says something. <laughs> And uh, after queen b6, knight b3, this is still such a typical position. Love, a5 love it. is a usual move to create more space on the queen side for black and also try to chase away this b3 knight just threatening a4. Yeah, and one of the things where a player like Jan Elvis has an advantage over a player like Conrad Holt, Conrad is a great player, Jan is a great player, but they're from totally different generations. Conrad Holt's around 24, 25 years old. He grew up with the engines and with you know the, having uh, computers to help evaluate openings. Jan has that old school style being like, you know, I've seen this position countless times. I have so much practical experience. Let me just keep pushing the position. I can play this quickly because I know the underlying ideas here. And for example, where's this bishop on h4 going? If I'm white, do I play for f3 or f4? But if I play mm -hmm. for f4, then maybe e4 is weak. 
If I play for F3, then maybe my dark squares are weak and a move like knight h5 will be annoying. So uh, just in yeah. general, these are some of the concepts that come to mind here. And I have a ton of faith as someone who's played Jan Elvis many times back when he was in the States. Um, really strong and player with an incredible amount of knowledge. Yeah, he used to be world number four, if I'm not mistaken, number four or number five. And he clearly is a very strong player still. White is ignoring the threat of black on the queen side. Yep. Pushes f4, but that allows uh, a4. Actually, he's provoking his opponent. Go a4 if you want to. I'm curious about his idea. Bishop to f2. I mean, just queen b4, right? Just put the queen up. Yes. And then take on b2. Pawn grabber, pawn greediness is our pawn grabbing that got some hype in the chat for free stuff on the board and grabbing pawns i love it and including the bagel for robert yeah this um that's for you robert i appreciate it. i mean my appreciation it... and love i was looking two emotes. <laughs> i was looking at the twitch chat and i was feeling the love but then i was feeling the hunger because i saw the <laughs> bagels pop up there me too me too and i have some of the belgian chocolate that robert has given me i still have some left i'm keeping it for like sos moments but it might be approaching already it might be approaching yep and um, well, okay, I'm seeing you take the chocolate, so <laughs> I'm just distracted now. I'm like, oh gosh, You're taking me back to my couple of days in Belgium. my vacation in Belgium. Why comes a good times? Good times for sure, and only more good times to come. So I see this match, Jeffrey Zhang is still playing. His position to me doesn't look super fascinating. Who else is Max Schockman against GMG? Yes, that is this match. That game looks interesting. It's Andre Gorovets with the black Ooh. pieces. And I'm liking the Destiny's chances on this board because even material, but this pawn is already on C3. And I mean, black, black's position looks amazing. It totally. Uh, that knight on D5 is a beast. The rooks, the queen, all the black pieces basically are ideally placed. And after C3, if B takes C3, knight takes C3 almost traps the queen. Well, it's wins I'm on, loving yep. Black's chances. Isn't he just winning material after B takes C3, Knight takes C3? Yep, wins a... Knight E2, Fork Knight. Yep, you win a Rook on C1. Thank you. Because yeah, it's checked. Thank you, next. <laughs> oh, look at you. Pulling out the Ariana Grande <laughs> references here. I feel you. I see you. I do my best. <laughs> I see you, Anna. You're paying attention to that pop culture. So it's funny, I always joke with Alexandra because she would definitely know thank you, next. But there are some older references that I make which, you know, makes me like, well, how, we're, all, we're only a couple years apart. How do you not know this? But I'm like, I guess sometimes those couple years make a difference. But thank you, next, of course, Ariana Grande. And I, actually, in the U.S. Amateur Team East, there was a team name called Thank You Check. Oh, so I'm loving it. I thought that was, that was a somewhat clever, but maybe not the best, but at least they had their mind on pop culture references. So I got to give them props for that. <laughs> Let's go and see. Well, there's one more board in this match, and that is Christopher Tulin versus Kirill Chukavin. I'm not sure I want to spend much time here. I just wanted to check in how it is going so far. Uh, it is not the most exciting position, but I like White's position because of having more space. Very <laughs> logical setup. Why Black is struggling a little. He had to go Bishop E8. Yes. Um, Yikes. Now, this is what happens when you don't have much space and you struggle to coordinate your pieces. Yeah, this looks not great at all for black. And I know it's from a semi-slav, but it kind of looks like a Scandinavian. I'm sorry, John Bartholomew, I'm not trying to hate on Team Scandi, but it looks like a Scandinavian gone wrong because, well, I guess there's an e-pawn for white, so I take that back. It really just mm -hmm. looks like a semi-slav. But similar concepts happen with this pawn on c4 rather than e4. And in fact, sometimes you want that pawn on c4 because your bishop is stronger on the g2 square but the point is black has no space white should not rush because sometimes people play this move pawn to e5 thinking i'm just gaining even more space but then you give black some central squares with the knight coming to d5 so this is actually very common e5 knight d5 knight e4 but mm -hmm. you do have to make sure you're doing this in a timely fashion otherwise you're actually allowing black to breathe a little bit more as you've uh, committed to a pawn structure what are they they're repeating moves is he repeating again now bishop b4 knight a2 is that what he wants i hope not well i don't want, I don't want to do that yeah i don't want to be here if that does happen so i agree with you we're not going to spend a lot of time in this game where let's go should, somewhere else where should we go 
Anish Giri, let's check in with the top Chesbra. He is gone four out of four. Can he win again? He's facing Michelangelo, aka Grandmaster Luca Lenic. The Turtles badly need a victory. They need to score in the Battle Royale, but so far they are not doing well at all. Yeah, right now here with the white pieces, I like Anish Giri's position. I understand there is an isolated pawn on d4, but I have the I don't have the two bishops, but I have activity. So what I like for white is that at some moment I can consider playing for pawn d5. So I'd play bishop mm -hmm. b3, queen h3, and then try to say, you have to look out for that e6 pawn at all times. Because I might just sacrifice a bishop or a knight, I'm not sure which, at some moment on that square, and you're not going to be a happy camper when that happens. So um, yeah, bishop b3 really speaks to me here. Knight takes e6. Even now, it doesn't look so... T Ooh, that move I don't like. Um, yes, I was... I was really buying your idea with bishop b3, but knight e4, what's the idea? Yeah, because now, so what black really wants, honestly, is to trade off the knight and the bishop for, that's a great move, knight if I was about to say, if I could take on e4 and trade my bishop and knight for your two knights, black is very happy because the bishop on c2 has no diagonals to work with, right? There's nothing for it. If that was a dark square bishop, it'd be a totally different story. But it's a light mm -hmm. square bishop with nowhere to go. Yeah. The f7, e6 pawn trade blockades that diagonal. The h7, g6 pawn chain blocks the C b1, h7 diagonal. I am loving what Luca Ledge is doing here, and I really don't like Anisha's position anymore. I'm really struggling to understand the point behind knight g to e4. It's a solid move, but it's not Anish's style to just go for something solid when he's got the upper hand. So, well, even even Anish may not crush everyone, but who knows? After night a5, it's still game on, but Black has certainly improved his chances. Yep. And speaking of improved chances, I'm going back to the board four game. Or no, it's not board four. It's board three for the Destiny and the Stony Horse. That's Max Schachman with GMG. That's their username on chess.com, but that's Andre Gorbitz with the black pieces against Tuan Berg. And Gorbitz is now up material, so he's improved his chances even more of winning this mm. game because he we saw him play C3, he took on yeah. D2, and White seemingly had nothing better than to get in a position where sacrifice had well, watch not didn't he did have stuff better, he just blundered his rook anyway. So yeah. B3, B2 speaks to me right now. Push that B pawn. Push him, baby. Push him, baby. Yeah, there it is. Yasser would be very proud here. They're not chess bras playing, but still, they're pushing them, and, well, it's just looking great. So this is going to be a win for the Dallas Destiny. But what about their other boards? I can't recall. And we looked at the opening of Jeffrey, but I don't know how he's doing at the moment. Uh, let me pull that up. Let me see. Jeffrey, bam. Okay. Whoa. Wait. This looks great for... No, black's not up a pawn. Um, Feels like a pawn up, though. Yeah, the pawn structure, right? This ugly C4 pawn, ugly A2 pawn. Yeah. Black has two pawn islands. White has three. Because what we call pawn islands are when pawns are on files adjacent to each other. That's just... That remains in the same pawn island. Whereas A2 and C4 are disconnected. And Anna... Do you think there's going to be a checkmate in the light squares for black here? I would love to see that. I would love to see a mate coming. We are very far from witnessing that, but certainly there are holes on the light squares. Um, Danny Ranch would come up now with some of the cheese references that you are used to. Yep. And I think that's a very fair evaluation. Queen e4, and totally. Just you have this king cut off on the light square. So if this knight can go from e6 to g5 to h3, Obviously, that's not going to happen, but if it could happen, maybe queen to a8, knight to e4. Something like that is actually very feasible. And you said cheese. I haven't been able to think about cheese the same way since I went to Taunton Garby in, um, in Belgium, in Brussels. Oh. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. No, don't tell me about it. I love cheese. Uh-oh, I mean, uh-oh, look at this move. I'm not a chocoholic, but cheese is my other love. How about free knights? Rook takes d4. Oh, Tactic. <laughs> free stuff. Shout out to free stuff and grabbing free stuff. Queen e2. That's it. Good tactical Queen vision stuff. by Jeffrey Zhang. 
The rook on b1 needs the rook on d1's protection. The pawn on e3 can't capture because the queen is hanging behind the e-pawn, and rook takes d4, queen takes b1. That wins a full knight. That is great tactical vision by Yeah, Jeffrey. queen e2 was a one-move blunder by Meshkos. Not something you usually see from a 2550 rated grandmaster, but he did step into it. Game over. Meshkov struggling. The Destiny are smashing the horses at the moment. Two other boards we didn't discuss recently. Uh, there's the game of Tulin against Chukavin. Okay, I'm back there. Whoa. But Tulin's still on, in the driver's seat. I like his position a lot. <laughs> I'm immediately thinking, can I go 94, 9 of 6 check? Right? Like, yeah. When I see... It's calling. The position is calling for it. Just... Bring this knight or knight or h5 and then h6 or g. I mean, can black do anything here? Like just knight e4, you play that instantly and you figure out the rest later. Okay, honestly, he's got a lot of time, so he's doing a good job yeah. of considering the options. But Anna, knight e4 to okay, eight, like I said, h5 seems perfectly reasonable as well. But just put that knight on f6. Definitely, he played h5 instead. Also a promising move, and I was already. Loving the idea of knight e4, knight f6, knight f6, giving up the knight on f6 to create an f6 pawn and potentially a mate on the g file. Yep. Uh-oh, this looks so bad. Rook f1. Could it be 4-0? So far, the Destiny are really about to score an impressive win against the second place team, Whoa. the horses. Yeah, and I see two queens on the board, and that's Gorvets <laughs> up a queen here. 4-0, they are about to do it. You think so? Let's go over to the Conrad yeah. Holt game because Twanberg, of course, is dead lost, but Conrad Holt game is actually interesting here. So I guess Elvis. I have no idea what Conrad Holt's up a pawn, but his bishop's under attack. His queen doesn't look like it's actually that safe, is it? I fool. Because, like, for example, if you play bishop g3, can I play bishop f8 and go after queen f6? Oh, you can go queen c7. I didn't even see that move. Wow, so maybe that's an option. I don't know here. I still like Elvis' chances. Somebody tells me that Black has... Wait, the rook on e1's hanging. Yeah. But then, Bishop, just... but then Bishop c7, intermediate move. Oh, okay. I was like, why is he not taking it? Bishop c7 would win the d8 rook, so he has to deal with that threat first. Rook d7, queen e8, check. Oh, but where's your queen going after that? So rook d7, queen e8, bishop f8. My next move is rook d7 back to d8, trapping your queen. Ooh, and the rook on e1 is hanging. Yes, Elvis is making it so that it wouldn't be 4-0. Now it's about to be 3-1, still a victory for the destiny, but Elvis, with the uh, saving the pride of the horses, if he wins this game, bishop f8 is on the board now. Instead of rook d7, he went bishop f8 immediately. Which is, I think is still a good move, because what is white going to do here? You, you Queen f6? Okay, is, is it going to... Bishop back to g7? Yeah. I don't want to see a repetition, though. Because you he can't... He has to try to win. Yeah, you can't take on e1, because bishop e5 is probably just checkmate immediately. Right, like, queen's... Oop, I made a horse diagonal, but a queen goes to h8. <laughs> right, it's just mate. So... Yeah. You don't have time to take this rook on e1. So bishop g7 back is probably forced here, otherwise you're just losing. Yes. But then when the queen is on e7, maybe he should really try rook d7. I like your idea about rook d7, queen e8 check, bishop f8. Yeah. It looks very promising. Well, this is the only chance. Uh, Jeffrey has won his game already. Jeffrey Xiong beats Nikita Meshkovs. Yeah. Then also, uh, Gorovets has won his game against Tuan Borg. So it's 2-0 in favor of the, the Dallas Destiny. Uh, Christopher Tulin with the mating attack against his opponent's king on the g5. Knight of six is on the board! Oh. Tulin! Knight of six! Tulin! He's just... Tulin is doing it! I mean, let's see. How do you... Where's the knockout punch here? So, do you take on h7 and play bishop e4? Or do you play bishop e4 right away? Do you play queen to e4 to maybe force the action over there on the king's side? Although, you do have to be careful, because now that my king's on h8, maybe there is a time where I can take that piece. Right? Like, I can actually... Yeah. So he went bishop e4. So. Bishop e4 to force the capture on f6. If g takes f6, he can take back with any of the pawns. Um, I was going to say yes, any of the pawns. But probably g takes f6, opening the g5, threatening mate on g7. So, okay, g takes, right? You take with the knight on f6. 
e takes f6, bishop f6. So black will be up a pawn at the end of that variation, but the question is, can I go king h1, rook g1, and mate 2 in the g-file, or somehow get my queen to h6 or h7? I don't know. It's actually, it's not so straightforward anymore. And I think Tulin, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, we saw him win earlier that game, which was totally lost against Sarah Holt. Here, mm -hmm. this is one of those where he could actually end up losing because the trajectory of the game was so easily just better. Every variation was better. Now he has to calculate yeah. precisely. And when you go from that kind of advantage where any move is good to, okay, I have to find a series of precise moves just to keep the edge, that's when you start making mistakes. <coughs> Sorry, I was about to talk and then my, I was like, oh, I need to cough too. But I was about to say the same, that uh, he's thinking because now he is considering that if he takes on f6, uh, black will take as well, it's giving up the piece, but winning a pawn. Maybe he's considering bishop takes h7 first and then to take on f6. Oh, now we're but, talking. But uh, that's, that's looking uh, not so straightforward either. Yeah, maybe f5 is the move to throw in after bishop h7, so attack your queen yeah. and say, if you take on f5, that's a much better version for black, because so my rook on a6 actually comes to the defense. It has the c, uh, excuse me, the sixth rank to work with. So, yeah, it's something. Something has slipped out of his hands. It was easier earlier. Maybe it's still okay for Tulin, but the tendency is not looking good for the player of the Dallas Destiny. Give some hope for the horses. Yep. So this is. I said horses with a very Russian accent. I think Did... horses. <laughs> <laughs> and these are two horses, by the way, the ponies versus the horses. Isn't that like a horse or a pony in the logo of the Dallas Destiny? What, what's horse in Russian? Like lo, Loshad, is that right? Um, I think yes, so. I think so. I, I mean, I took Russian a long time ago, but that was one of the... Me too, Yeah. But about 10 years ago. Because I remember it's similar to, um, I think, Square, right? Square, yeah. that's Ploshad, yeah, yeah exactly. and this is Loshad, yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to be banned by our moderators if we keep talking in a different language. So. Oh, true. English true. only. <laughs> Anna. Chat, English only. <laughs> Anna, look at the time situation, by the way, in this Ooh. game. Tulin has spent two minutes on move 36, another 35 seconds on move 37, and now he's thinking some more. So I, I'm really concerned about this game for him. He should just put his king probably on h or 1, just to keep it on a light square. I think that's the best move. And that way it means that the rook is also swinging to g1, and you're probably d5. No, oh, no way. What is that? Uh, I just wanted to mention that the game where we were looking at earlier, Elvis with the black pieces against Conrad Holt, it ended with a repetition of moves, a draw. Okay. That, I thought that might happen, but yeah, that's... Okay, that's a good result for the destiny for sure, but right now, the horses might still have a chance here because I don't like what's been happening in this game with Christopher Tulin. Yeah, I also don't like it, and no time for either player. After this game, I want to show a game that finished already, but we need to stick to this one. 14 seconds left for Chuka win. Yeah, can you play queen g8 here and just trade the queens off? I guess you have to be worried about the h pawn in the end game, but Bishop takes b2, what a brave move. He's very brave, but is he... Is he in a position to beat this brave rook c2, rook g2? Oh, queen f4, throwing queen h6 check, and it's the mate with bishop h7 check, bishop Ooh. g6. But now queen j check first. Okay, but queen h6 check Ooh. is still devastating if you allow it to happen. Maybe play f5 here, just as like a desperate... Oh, queen f8, what a calm move. Six seconds, oh, five God. seconds, four seconds, rook g1 played. Play. Oh my God, three seconds left, f5. I love it, f5, what a brave Good move. Position. Play e5, he's doing it, he's doing it. Take on d6. Can you take on that pawn? No time. Two seconds. He did it. He took the pawn. Now his rook comes to the defense of the sixth rank and attacks that bishop on d3. Bishop c6 check. Counterattack. One. Whew. I'm about to black. Bishop c6. Bishop c5 oh, he did board. it. Rook d2 is coming with check. Rook d2 yes. check. King h3. Bishop d7 check. It's over. He's giving mate. Oh, wrong, wrong, on the board. wrong move. Why? Why with the queen? Wrong. Take the, take the bishop. Queen f5 and the bishop d7. Take the bishop d7. Rook d3 check. Oh, oh, no time. No time. Missing everything. But, I mean, it's really crazy tactics here. What is rook h3? That's desperation. I, he can't prevent mate. It's queen g7 and queen h6. White is giving mate. Oh, my God. What a finish. What a turnaround. Because black played really well here. I thought f5 and e5 was actually a genius strategy. Because sometimes when you're under attack, the best way to defend is getting counterplay. One f5. Went e5, hitting the queen. h6 is under control. Queen g5. 
went rook takes d6. Then he had bishop c6 check, and he said king's going up, and this is the biggest mistake he could have made. He went queen to c8, which is such a natural response. Oh Instead, God. bishop d7 check, getting another piece into the game. The king, if it goes to h4, gets mated via h2. If you block with, you can't block on f5 with the bishop anymore because it's covered by the queen and the bishop. If you go rook g4, well, I can even just take that rook and you're um, not getting away with this. So a really big missed opportunity by Chukavan who defended admirably from what was a terrible position. But unfortunately for him, he didn't have much time and he went down in this game. What a dramatic finish. 5,216 of you have been witnessing this final moment between Tulin and Chukavin. Incredible stuff. He was about to lose and he was about to win and then he lost and no time on the clock. Crazy stuff. And uh, that means that in the end, the Destiny, they have won this round three and a half half against the Estonia horses. I just wanted to show the final position between Twamborg and Andre Gorovets, okay. if you still have that board up. I do. Whoa, what? <laughs> no way. I know, it's beautiful. No way. Also, Eric Hansen just lost the game I had up, but what is this? Oh no. Are you kidding me with three queens, excuse me, four queens? <laughs> so that means white didn't resign for a long time and black felt disrespected. Gorovets was not happy about it. So let's see what actually yeah. happened. So he queened the B pawn and they traded queens and then they queened the A pawn. And then he said, I don't want to checkmate you. Of course I can, but I'm just going to queen all my pawns. And here comes the H pawn now. And okay, finally decided to checkmate him. So that is, I understand. So people ask me this all the time. Like, when is resigning? Like, when are you, should you resign? Like, I'm like, you should, you can always play. It's your right. Nobody could say otherwise. But there is a certain moment where it becomes disrespectful and four queens against a bear king, I think that yeah. has crossed the line by at least three queens. And that's why I think uh, Gorovitz started creating this geometry with the queens because it was totally disrespectful that White kept on playing. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Would I deliver the checkmate right away or go to four queens and maybe even play a little bit more just to torture the person? I just... Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, like I said, I really believe in every player's right to play on because you can never win a game that you've already given up on or you can never get even half a point in a game you've resigned. So I do think that in general, playing on is the right strategy. But when you're down four queens like this, then it just becomes offensive. So Yeah, there's a limit to everything, especially yeah. when your opponent is a grandmaster too. So this has been round five of the Battle Royale. I don't see any more games going on. That means that we have two more rounds to go. And so far, the standings are looking great for the Dallas Destiny, who have just beaten the Estonia Horses. That means that they are very close to be claiming the title. It's about being first, because that will be 24 points for the Dallas Destiny, but also the game points matter. So they will want to score as many as possible to add to the 24 points they may grab for the first place. Now for the turtles, it's still looking very bad. The bears are also in a critical situation because of being uh, the seventh place team in the central division and they are not scoring much in the battle royale. The pawn grabbers, well, uh, they are not on the verge of relegation in terms of the standings, but the battle royale can really shake up everything. So. I'm not very confident about the pawn grabbers either. How do you see the situation so far, Robert? And which teams can still make it? No, I, I'm completely with you here. And uh, I think first place is all but wrapped up here. The Destiny are going to win. But it's interesting to see the Wizards. I feel like I haven't paid any attention to them. But suddenly the Wizards are in second place, tied with the mm -hmm. uh, Estonia Horses. But I also want to point out that the Tbilisi gentlemen, right, they are... Um, have been, I'm going to pull up the standings here. They've been dominating the season, 140 points uh, before this week, and they're not having their best showing. We've just come to just we, we become used to their dominance, um, and this week, right now, they're just in the middle of the pack. So, so uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that's for me. That's a little bit odd. Just not seeing Volkov and Kuparadzi and Jabawa and. Um, Pantsulaya just kill everybody because that's what I'm used to. Yeah, totally. I'm also surprised that Anish Giri didn't go five out of five. He dropped half a point in the last round uh, that he has just played. 
against Luka Lenic. He didn't manage to convert that advantage he had after the opening against the top turtle. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, I don't know. I still can't over this four queens either. I'm like, this, I, I'm never really speechless, but when you see four queen checkmate, um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Jay Brazel, I'm sorry if you are rooting for the pawn grabbers. I wish the best for the pawn grabbers, but I'm just stating the fact that unfortunately for everyone from Pittsburgh, they are not doing very well so far as you can see from the scores. So they, they should somehow step up their game in the remaining two rounds of the Battle Royale. Anna, by the way, this is something that we didn't mention, but if you look at the destiny across the board, three and a half, three and a half, three and a half, four and a half. Can you talk about any better team chemistry there? Oof, yeah, amazing. Your, your answer to that should have been, Robert, our team chemistry is better but yeah, they're also oh, impressive. Oh, I'm sorry I missed that. I missed that on the opportunity. I would, I take that for granted, Robert. <laughs> I think it doesn't need to be mentioned. It's a fact. Yeah. No, I mean, you, I don't think you really take it for granted. But I just uh, thought that it was a really opportune moment there for you to, you know, give us a shout out because, well, Anna, I love doing commentary with you. So I just am wishing and hoping that you feel the same way. Likewise, Robert, and everyone else who enjoys that commentary, if you hover your mouse to uh, the side of Robert, I think it's somewhere below the webcam of Robert, so move your mouse there and there's going to be some magic bat buttons in purple appearing on the screen. You can click on the channel of Robert. Uh, there's also the Process League channel and even my channel up there. So if you guys want to give us a follow on our own channels, we also stream. Robert streams on his channel too. I'm streaming now more often than before. So give us some love if you appreciate what we are doing. But I also hope, Robert, that we're going to be back commentating together more often. Absolutely. Purple buttons, purple buttons. Yay! Yeah, so hopefully uh, people can find that. That's but. Right. Thank you. Oh, what, what's to say about the chess? I pulled up the Jeffrey Jean game against Anish Giri because that's for... Jeffrey didn't blunder matey one. That's a good start. Really, that's a good start <laughs> to the game when you avoid um, when you avoid blundering checkmates. That's definitely a good thing. And the checkmate yeah. that Anna was talking about was with a knight on g4. You always have to watch the h2 square. And very importantly, there was no knight on c6 because that's sort of the trick that often players use is when there's a knight over there on g4 that you have a second knight that maybe can come to d4 to distract the knight on f3. But that knight has been long gone in this Rosalimo. And, okay, we have a, an influence from a certain world championship match. That would be Caruana Carlson. The Rosalimo has become incredibly popular thanks to the games where Magnus Carlson was black. And, okay, I think black has a very normal position here. You have ideas with knight to h5, maybe to play for f5 or knight to f4. You can play it more calmly with an adventure like b6 and bishop to e6, things like that as well. So I like black's flexibility in positions like this. I, I'll say that much. Yeah, and now he's going for the typical plan of placing the knight on h5. Later, he may advance the pawn to f5 or jump to f4 with the knight. Typical uh, position in the Rossolimo. I would like to switch to Eric Hansen for a moment because he started struggling, but I was wrong to switch because so far it's a very dull position to talk about. Robert, yeah. on to you. Yeah, we can go back to the Geary game. And actually, <laughs> something I wanted to mention was he went queen to c1, Jeffrey did, to go bishop to h6. But bishop h6 tends not to be that great a decision with his knight on h5 coming to f4. Instead, this thematic break, I actually used to play the white side of the Rosalimo, so I know this very well. Bishop to e3, black plays mm -hmm. b6 on move, uh, so 14 bishop e3, black plays b6, white plays b4. A thematic yeah. pawn sacrifice. If you take with the c pawn, now my bishop is open to the pawn on b6. If you take with the a pawn, I play a5, sacrificing a second pawn, so that I get your c pawn, which is the, one of the probably the most important pawn of the position, as then it starts opening things up for my pieces. So I take on c5 with my bishop, now I have the b6 square, the d6 square, the a5 pawn that you've captured will be weak. And so that is just something that I think uh, players who are not so familiar with the Rosalimo, they may not be as in tune to that kind of line. Yeah, instead White went for the trade of the dark squared bishops, the bishop h6, bishop takes g7. But black is doing more than okay here with the knight already on f4. 
I feel like Jeffrey went on the safe side a bit too much. Um, Maybe he's yeah. still okay, but... Um, no, I agree with you. I think black is better. Sorry, I was saying um because uh, I was trying to f just think about what the, the plan would be, but I totally agree that this is... it's. It's toothless. That's how I would describe it. <laughs> They've eaten too much chocolate. <laughs> I would love some chocolate. I was just thinking about it. Like, I'm trying to keep that high energy, but I'm like... I'm trying to send some over virtually to you from the same box that you have given to me, Robert. Belgian oh. chocolate. The oh. very best. I mean, it, it is delicious, isn't it? It's just... I know. It was, yeah. You know, I, I just went to... To Bruges, and I was like, you know, we're getting so off the actual chest, but it's worth it. So, um, <laughs> time to do it. We've been here for three hours. Yeah, I was in Bruges, like that fantastic movie that hopefully everyone in the chat has seen. But I was there and we was walking around with some friends, and I see the chocolate shop. And it was this Dumont's, it was really nice. The, um, yeah, the owner, so nice. The owner, she was amazing. So, I was talking to her, and I was like, okay, I don't know which chocolate to get. She goes, let me pick my favorites. For your friend and oh. so i was like okay anna would love this and so um i'm totally loving it one of the one of the pieces that i have in the box is actually an actual horse it looks like a chess knight oh. i'm loving it yep so you're it's almost like mcdonald's right because bum 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 you're loving it <laughs> i'm totally loving it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just accidentally did this again where so on chess.com uh over the notation if you like there's that yeah. it says like sicilian defense uh Nezhmedinov, Russ Limo, and I clicked on that by accident, uh, and then it sent me to a new tab with the opening. So that's actually a cool thing that Chess.com offers, where you can just click on it so you can explore the opening yourself. But I don't want to explore the opening because I'm trying to, you know, talk with you about the games. I just keep clicking that accidentally. Totally. Shout out to every other chocoholic in the chat. There are over 5,000 of you tuning in to week seven of the Pro Chess League. We so appreciate that you are here with us. And remember, this is just the first group today after our commentary with Robert, Danny Rensch and Alexandra Botas will be covering the last battle royale. So after that group is over, that's when the standings will be updated. And there are more points up for grabs, so everything can be shaken up in all four divisions. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So um, there's a lot to play for, of course. There's a lot to see. I mean, amazing players will be in the later time slot as well. So it's not like, you know, you came here, you saw all the best players play, oh, there's nothing left for you. Well, we're seeing Anish Giri play right now, but in the last division, you still have players like Georg Meyer, um, uh, Mama Jarv is playing, Gawain Jones, Pavel Elyanov. So <laughs> pretty strong field in the last... Whoa. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I turned my the head back to the Eagles. Uh, Artek Manukian is saying, show us stability. Of course, the Eagles have a big interest in the gentlemen not doing very well today because they are playing for the first place in the Eastern Division. Yep. Big rivalry between the gentlemen and the Eagles. Yeah, they, uh, the Eagles really want the gentlemen to struggle so they can overtake them in that crazy division that has two of the highest performing teams, not of, two, the two highest performing teams in the league. What yeah, is going on in the entire league. with this game between Jeffrey and Anish? Because B6 was lost, sure. but C4 was gained. Mm -hmm. And how is that trade, according to you, Robert? I like it from White's point of view, because Black's left with these ugly pawns. So at best, like, let's say I trade the C5 pawn for the B2 pawn. White at least yeah. has this outside pawn, this A pawn. And I think the position is probably approximately level, slightly better for white, but I see, I think about the bigger picture. And I'm just like, all right, if I win C5, if, you know, I lose B2, but I take C5, I have an A pawn, you have a C pawn. The C pawn is closer to the king side. And so that if there is a rook end game, that is favorable for white. If it's a king and pawn end game, that might just be winning for white. So I like the decision queen B3 to keep C5 protected, to hopefully get your queen to C2 and attack multiple pawns. I think the game will fizzle out. That's my estimation but i think that i do prefer white ever so slightly just because of the c versus a pawn dynamic i agree with you so it's looking good for jeffrey uh depends on how ambitious he is but so far it's at least the draw which is already a big score against the world number four and is geary yeah now let's see what's going on on the remaining boards between the top team of today the dallas destiny and the fan favorite chess bras Eric Hansen with the white pieces against Conrad Holt. 
he has managed to improve his position quite a lot. Now I'm liking it for white with more space in the center, the d6 square, bishop d2 finally developing that bishop 2, and then the rook can come to the c file or d file. Anna, I really, really, really hate black's position here. Right? Like, yeah. white has the space and the compensation because. Indeed, <laughs> the space, the pair of bishops, active pieces. What is it that black has? Uh... Less time. Less time. Uh, <laughs> knights that are tripping over each other. A bishop on c4 yeah. that has nothing to work with. Uh, the knight can go to, from e4 to d6. The bishop can go from d2 to a5. Ideally, it would be on a3. So another idea instead of bishop to d2 actually was probably playing for a queen move, say to f3, and then play b3, bishop a3, just to get that mm -hmm. bishop on the diagonal. But I like the queen there as well. And what's, I mean, honestly, on a, okay, bishop b5 was just played. What's black's next move? Um, I don't know, um, knight to <laughs> d7, c8, <laughs> one of those ugly squares, and I still don't have a next move. Yeah, I'm giving you another move. What's your next move for black? Uh, my back to b6. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I see where you're going with this. And I mean... It, I, I'm, I'm really disliking this position for black. It's a nightmare to play. Yeah, and it seems like we're joking when I'm asking you this question, but actually that's very important in chess, is trying to come with your opponent's ideas. And that goes to show that white doesn't need to rush. Because let's yeah. say I even pass. Let's say I made king h1. Black doesn't have any way to take advantage of it. So it's not like some variations you're like, okay, full steam ahead. Let me go g4, g5, or something like that. And honestly, maybe even g4, g5 is a reasonable plan here. I wouldn't do it, but it might be reasonable. But my point at large is that like white can sit on the position, improve the pieces one by one, play Karpovian chess. The knight on d5 can't move because my bishop goes to b4. The knight on c8 might need to stay there for the time being because the knight comes to d6. And, I mean, I just absolutely hate black's position here. So Totally. Uh, so it's looking very good for the main chess. But what about board three and board four in this very same match? Okay, board three, we have Andre Gorovitz against Nikolai Naritsyn. That game's interesting because Gorovitz has given up his queen but has a bishop and a rook for that queen. And the black king might not feel very safe either. I think black, mm -hmm. well, I don't love this move e4 because now I'm immediately trying to put my knight on d4 if I'm black. So knight c6 here, there it is. Um, so that pawn I would like to push back to e3. Yeah, I think black's better. Sometimes the minor piece and rook are enough compensation. Here I just don't see how you're, I would like to, tr and speaking of ideas, trading one pair of rooks would be excellent for black. So rook to come in e8 to trade there would help so that no rooks can't gang up on my king. Yeah, so it's a rook and a bishop for the queen. And with the knight coming in on d4, I completely agree with Robert that it's looking very good for Noritsyn and for the chess bras. This leaves us with board four, maroon tomb with the white pieces against Christopher Tulin. What happened on the king's side? Let's check it out. Whoa. Um, huh. What? Did, what? what? Um, what yeah. Where did... uh, <laughs> I also need a moment to digest. Uh, what's the material count to start with? It's even. It's even. I, th I thought I, he took something on h2 at least, a pawn maybe. <laughs> I thought black was up like two pawns, yeah. Feels like. So, okay, but look at the squares on the king side. g3, f4, e5, all controlled by black because you have two knights. Now, we always say two bishops advantage, and I think that term is actually very harmful because people think that yeah. whenever they can get the two bishops, they should. Here, white would much prefer to not have this situation where they have a light square bishop with, no one, with nowhere to work with and be able to cover up this hole on f4, for example. If you could put a knight on uh, g2 or a knight on h3 or something like mm -hmm. that, you see that you would be able to actually protect the dark squares, which you can't do with the light square bishop. So Tulin, four and a half out of five, I think he's well on his way to five and a half out of six here because he could just play simple chess. There's no need to rush. He's just going to continue dominating the dark squares. And if you allow me to trade bishops, my knight will sit on f4 for the rest of the game. Yeah, completely. I see that we have the first result of this round, which is a victory for Sergei Grigoryans of the Moscow Wizards against Nikita Meshkov of the Horses. So Meshkov's not doing very well so far. And this was the penultimate round. Yeah, Meshkov's having a tough day here, and the reason he resigned is because he actually cannot protect his knight on e6. The queen on f3 pins the f7 pawn, and the queen on g6 is protecting that knight, 
but now that I went knight h4 attacking your queen, you can play queen g5 attacking my knight on h4, but bishop takes e6 is too powerful with queen f7 check being me. So not good. Uh, totally. Uh, I was just trying to catch up with the chat as well. Of course, shout out to our moderators. We love you guys, and we couldn't do this without you and your support. There are over 5,400 of you tuning in to the Proces League Week 7. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Once again, this is the first group of the day, but once our broadcast with Robert is over, it's Alexandra Botas and Danny Ranch covering the next Battle Royale. So lots of action today here on Twitch and on chess.com. Don't go anywhere. Yeah, definitely. Definitely stay. I mean, I'm going to stay. You're going to stay. So We're going to stay. We're yeah. going to spend here the whole day just hanging out with you guys in the chat. Absolutely. So, And those of you who are, by the way, just tuning in and you don't know what the Approaches League is, this is the best esports competition in the world, the strongest teams facing each other with the top players, including Fabiano Caruana, Anish Giri, Wesley So, uh, Hikaru Nakamura, Ding Lira, and they all have their own teams representing their cities. So this is a, such an exciting format. And the finals of the Protest League will be on site. It's not announced yet where, but you got to mark it in your calendar, May the 4th and the 5th. You will want to be there. Esports event for the second time, chess.com and Twitch are bringing it all together. It's the event of the year. You want to be there. I'm promising you this is something you don't want to miss, right? Robert, we're going to be there hanging out. Yeah, you definitely don't want to miss that. We'll have a lot of fun. And it, just the action was great. Last year, the Armenian Eagles beating the Shangdu Pandas in a tie break. And that was really fun to see. And I see Sam Copeland. He's now upset I'm not yelling at him. He goes, I think Gary just slowed down to be a bro to Robert and hit six out of seven on the nose. Firstly, he's not a bro. He's a bra. Get it right. Second of all, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's now five out of six. So my six out of seven or on his five and a half out of seven. It's going to be, you know, a close one there. He wins the last game. I'm right. If he draws, you're right. Should we, you know, put a little chocolate wager on it? Yeah, let's do that. All right. So whoever is right. What if he loses? Then we, neither of us win. I don't think he's going to lose. I agree. So whoever loses has to buy the other person chocolate. How does that sound? Okay, deal. All right. Everyone, everyone heard it. Everyone? I'm shaking your virtual hand, Robert. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm going to shake back. I guess... I should, oh, wait, right. I, I guess I should reach out in, wait, this direction. Yeah, so do I, I'm going to reach, wait, no, you're the, you're doing the wrong way. Yeah, I was like, I was pointing at the camera, but you are on my left, right? Yeah, I don't know. I think you're pointing, you, you're, you're the other way. You, 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 yeah, there, there. I'm so confused. No, you, 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 <laughs> this way. yeah, there we go. Let's use that hand. There we go. Okay, we shook on <laughs> So I just, everyone saw it happen. That's a handshake. We all agreed on this. Oh. <laughs> I'm so, totally confused. So it's official now. So <laughs> it is official. I'm winning a chocolate. <laughs> so you want Anish to draw now, and I want him to win. So I, you know, I think the fans want to see a win. So the fans are rooting for me. No offense to you. So let, uh, we'll see it happen. Well, I would like to see him win. Matter yeah. of fact, but I love a good chocolate. So okay, Anish, please be just very considerate of my diet and also remember your reputation it's on the line <laughs> that's a good it's way to put it it's on the line <laughs> nice try t t goes need a dab to make it official not dabbing not happening yay let's do that Robert. No. you can do it no nope. i saw you and sopico it's not happening i saw it it's not i saw it it was a one-time thing it was a slip <laughs> i'm working on it okay um by the way um, speaking of working on it, Conrad Holt's position looks a lot better than it did before because oh. he's no longer so cramped and he's actually up a pawn temporarily. So I think Hansen is probably still doing perfectly fine, but is in danger of once again letting a game get out of his control. What about the rest of the board? So if it was a draw between Anish and Jeffrey, I've just seen that they agreed in a draw already. Um, Gorovitz versus Noritin. Okay, Gorovitz, GMG. Still looking very good for black with the queen versus the rook and bishop. Yep. Oh, I mean, you could threaten checkmate in one with queen to c6, aiming for the g2 square. That looks quite promising. How do you, yeah, how are you going to stop my mate? Queen c6, you go rook g3. Ooh. I get knight e2 check, forking yeah. and winning the rook. If you play. So he, f3. he has to go f3, but uh, that gives up the h3 pawn. Yikes. Yikes, that pawn is hanging with check, among other issues. So queen c6 played. 
F3 is, well, we don't see any other move, but you do have to watch out because knight e5 is in the air here. So if you play knight h3, maybe I can, no, I don't even have somewhere to go with my king, because king g2, you go up knight f4, check. King h2, you can probably go knight g5 and give a check on the c7, score, or, or pin on the c7 score if the knight goes to e5. So, yeah. Hmm. yeah, maybe you can get away with taking, but, and there he took. Yeah, this is looking very promising for Norton and the Chess Bros. What about the other game in this match? Maroon Tomb with the white pieces against Christopher Tulin. Uh, still looking very good for Black, so that will be good news for the Dallas Destiny if Tulin manages to convert this. But earlier it looked more dangerous for White when the Queens were still on the board. Yeah, this actually gives much better chances to hold. And one of the big issues for Black is the back rank. Because with my pawn on g5, for white, it, it makes it hard for black to push any of these pawns as I will take whichever one goes in my path. And now the a6 pawn is hanging, the b6 pawn is hanging. Important to note that bishop f1 was played so that rook c1 check didn't end the game because your king needs an escape score and h2 is covered. So bishop f1 gives the king the g2 space to work with. And after b5, if I'm white, I consider do I play a move like a4 to try to get this pawn. King g2 makes sense, but if I go a4 and you take, I can put my rook on a5 just to try to gather your pawns on the a file. So, Yeah, totally. I'm taking a little bit of a tour among the remaining games in other matches. If there's anything exciting we are missing out on, I briefly looked at the game between Shabalov and Brown, trying to understand who is doing better. Because both kings are vulnerable, there's a rook that's pinned on the long diagonal. Robert, what's your take on this? Um, black is up a full rook, but is worse. And maybe is losing. Because hmm. I did a quick material count, and I saw two rooks to one, but this e-pawn feels very, very strong. So um, can I... Hmm, maybe not losing. But, so 96 here runs into queen... Oh, I just take on g7 because you can't take with a knight because queen Ooh, f8 is because checkmate. because of queen f8 and back rank mate. Puzzle rush. Oof. Get your puzzle rush emotes out. Yeah, that is going to be Ooh. painful. So queen f4 played. Yeah, this is... That's nasty. That's super it nasty. Is. Yeah, that's a wow. problem because 96 clearly was the intention to protect the rook and to attack the queen and to attack the bishop all at once. But unfortunately, that tactic is not going to be... I was like immediately like, oh, 96 now looks good for black. What was I calculating? And I'm like, nope. Puzzle rush. Made on the oh, back totally Puzzle rush. Yeah, this is actually a very good puzzle rush. So Sam. Sam Copeland. <laughs> Sam. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love those emotes in the chat. You guys are the best. Look at this beautiful emote art that our Twitch community comes up with. I don't even know if Sam's in charge of that. I don't think he is. But it's just fun to get Sam's attention that way. And Sam, I, I was calling out to you because Puzzle Rush needs this game. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so you, you don't even mean it for the article. You just want Sam to pin this for Puzzle Rush. I want, yeah, I just love getting Sam's help with things like this. So, yeah, yeah I know you do, you're just craving Sam's attention. I know. He doesn't, he just, he has too many priorities in his life that aren't me. It's just, it's just yeah, Wait. I know, like family, kids. Yeah, things like that. That Work. Queen, mm. Queen G6. I know. Whoa! What? What happened? Yeah, I'm loving it. I thought that it was already winning. It wasn't... No. Wait a second. Did he? No, the knight, thankfully, could go back to G8. So Queen takes G7 would work Ooh. as a mate because the rook is pinned, except that the knight can come back to block. But I, I also yeah. had the same thought. I just wasn't... So what happened is that? E7, knight takes, queen takes, and now... Whoa, wait a second. Wait. He has left his own back rank? Oh, no. And queen g4? He blundered. <gasps> he blundered. Who gives mate and he's flagging. Oh my gosh, I can't handle it. You blunder so much. Shaba, this is a vintage Shaba game until he made one final tremendous error here with rook f8, forgetting that queen to d1 hits the house. And so he lost on time in a completely lost position. This is not Shaba's day. This, I'm just not believing what I see. I can't believe this. White was winning with so many different moves and he decided to move the rook away from the back rank. The one and only 
a source resource left for black was this check on the background and the g file i can't believe it yeah i, I just I, can't believe it i had to move on it hurt too much and now i'm at the norizen game and speaking of players who are really fumbling away great positions norizen we talked out he was, should be winning before with the black pieces and now he's just going to make a draw so Norizin, Shabala, players that, you know, their teams are going to be a bit disappointed with them because they had so many chances to do better and to score more. Yeah. I think BJ came up with the right thematic song for the previous game that we were witnessing. Don't stop believing. Clearly, clearly it was such a hopeless situation, but Black kept on playing and he then was rewarded for his fighting spirit. Yep. This is... Hold on to that feeling. <laughs> you guys, oh, you guys no. are, are rocking they, it in the chat. They're singing? Let me check the chat. I'm just opening it up now. Oh, yeah, they are singing. <laughs> uh, Robert, time for you to make a cover. I mean, I'm just a city boy, you know? Born and raised, in, in, <laughs> born and raised in New York City. Where's the ambulance? They've been missing it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, yeah. you know, the ambulance hasn't gone by today, which is probably a good thing. It means that people aren't in harm's way. No, of course I'm happy. I'm happy that people are safe. Well, you know what's safe right now? And I'm going to make a great transition here. The Dallas Destiny, their lead looks oh. pretty safe at the top there with 17 points. And the Wizards Ooh. in second with 14. And the gentlemen, I kept talking about how they were in the middle of the pack. Well, now all of a sudden they're in third place with 13. And all right, looking across the board, Geary, five points. Christopher Tulin, yes. five and a half points for the Destiny. MVP. MVP. Totally MVP. He got lucky in some of his games, but he's deserving it for the fighting spirit. So Christopher Tulin scoring five and a half out of six. There's one more round left. But he's clearly doing it for the Dallas Destiny, but also Jeffrey, four out of six on the top board. And Conrad Holt, Andre Gorbitz holding their own. The great team spirit by the Dallas Destiny. Uh, they were in the second place of the Pacific Division, but with a victory in the Battle Royale, I believe they can bounce to the first place, depending on the game points, if they if they get ahead of the Chengdu Pandas. I'm very bad at maths, so I'm not going to try to do it on air, but they are, I think, on their way to become the top team of the Pacific. Yeah, no, this is, uh, uh, speaking of that, let me pull up the standings because you're, you're doing a good job of bringing this to the full picture here. Let me do the same and bring up this image. Standings. So Pacific, Di Pacific Division, the Shangdu Pandas were in first before this week's action, but as you keep pointing out, and, and rightly so, the Dallas Destiny, they are now the team to beat in the Pacific very impressive team led by Jeffrey Zhang on board one, Conrad Hall on board two. They're the staples of that squad. And, well, they are a force in this league. Yeah, and there was just a few point difference between the Pandas and the Destiny. I don't remember how many points the Pandas scored in their battle royale. That's what is missing from my Mets count. But I'm sure that Greg Shahadi and the rest of the crew remember it and they will remind us uh, how many points the Destiny need in order to take over in the lead. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So and it's not just about the Pacific, of course, but now, for instance, the Tbilisi gentlemen, if they finish on the third place, that still could be good for keeping their lead. Uh, the Turtles, unfortunately, they will not improve their position. The Horses... They have collected quite a lot of points today, so that's good news for the bottom team of the Eastern Division. And they definitely should not be in last anymore because the Moscow Phoenix got zero points because they didn't show up on Tuesday. Uh, there was a mistake with their manager thinking that their games were on Thursday, but they were on Tuesday, and uh, you hate to see that happen, but sometimes such is life. Yeah, Greg is uh, telling us that TBDC will keep their lead almost for sure. So a third place is good enough for them. The Chess Bros, um, how are the Chess Bros doing at the moment? Because I think they needed top four in today's Battle Royale. So they are in sixth place with 11 points. Hmm. Well, that's not good news because at the moment, the Chess Bros are not about to qualify for the playoffs. So as you guys know, 
10 weeks of protest league. That's the first stage. And we are right now in week seven. So today and three more matches are are coming up. But if the Chess Bras don't make it to the top four teams of the Atlantic Division, they will not qualify for the playoffs and that they cannot have a chance to play the finals in May at the esports event that you will be visiting. Yep. Just so that you know that you are you will be there. Yep, I will be there or I will be Ploshad, right? <laughs> <laughs> Totally. <laughs> uh, I mean, I feel like I had to do that. I'm, you know, I'm sorry no, to, to. It was, it was good. It was good. Yeah, I just want to. Last round. We are waiting for the games to begin. This is the last round, and there's a lot at stake. Whether Anirgiri makes a draw or wins his game, a chocolate is at stake. That's what we are here for. Chocolate at stake. So let us. Ooh, I'm getting hungrier and hungrier. Where's Anish? Where's Anish? Come on, I, I got to focus only on his game, not. You know, not look at anything else. Doesn't matter that the gentlemen are playing the Destiny and the gentlemen still have a chance at getting first if they sweep the Destiny. So, that, you know, anything's possible. It's not going to happen. I feel like Je if I'm Jeffrey Zhang, oh, okay, he's black. So if he had the white pieces, I would say just force a draw because that way you uh, for sure are going to win this match. Uh, but, okay, he's black, so he's going to have his work cut out for him anyway. Yeah, and Jabawa is not an easy opponent. Um, I briefly looked at Anish, but they are just making the first moves of the opening, and it's a Slav defense. Not one of the most exciting and sharpest variations, but that's good news for me. It's great news for me, because <laughs> you think you're going to win, so you'll be all excited, and that's great for us as a tandem here, the commentary, but then Anish is going to win, and then I get the spoils at the end of this. We shall see. I have faith in my boy. Yeah. I have faith in him too. <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, personally, I would love Anish to win, but because I predicted five and a half and I love chocolate too much, I gotta have my priorities. So, Anish, this game, draw. No, don't be draw Anish. Be Anish. You got this. Uh, but okay, we'll, we'll definitely keep an eye on this game because, as well, the Moscow Wizards are in second place and they mm -hmm. still have an outside shot of winning this Battle Royale as they have 14 yes. to Dallas is 17. So if somehow they can score, say, three and a half, and somehow Dallas, who's been amazing, only scores half, well, that'll be a problem. So do you want to be looking at the match between the Destiny and the Wizards, or do you just want to be looking at Anish for the remaining 10 minutes? <laughs> I want, I'll go wherever your heart desires. That's where I'm at right now. I'm like, I think we got to look at the Destiny match because it's for the first place. Okay. Let's Jeffrey Siong against Badur Jabawa. So I was mixing up the the round. It is the gentleman facing the Destiny, but that will matter also for the first place if the gentleman beat the Destiny. Wait, didn't a blunder just happen? Can't Jeffrey Siong go Bishop A6? Ooh. I mean, I saw a pawn on F2. Right? There's a queen on F6 and a bishop on C5. So isn't bishop a6 yes. just distracting this queen away from e2? And I don't, if you take, I'm going to go queen f2 check, king d1, queen f3 check, and win your rook on h1. Totally. So after bishop a6, white has to play queen d2. But then I can even go queen f3 and say, well, now you're not castling. I mean, I could take on f1 first. It doesn't matter because you're not castling either way, but queen on f3 seems like a good spot. How did this happen to Jababa? This is the scotch, and it's a very theoretical line where you're not supposed to be verse after seven moves. He played this move G3. I guess that was a... Uh... Move eight. <laughs> Mistake. Well, he it's annoying, this rook B8 move, because you can't move your B pawn, you lose your knight. You can't move your bishop on C1, you lose your pawn on B2. So hmm. maybe you play A3, B4, but that, or something like that doesn't work, because you can't go B4, I just said that. So I don't even know what you can do here. Um, hmm. So he, I think Jeffrey's thinking for so long because he believes that G3 might be some preparation and there's something about his bishop a6. Like, if he played against someone lower rated, I think he would have played bishop a6 immediately. But since this is Jobaba with the white pieces and he barely used any time, he's a little bit suspicious whether actually it's a blunder or something brilliant. 
Well, he also, and yeah, and he might also be thinking about move bishop d4, which feels very natural as well, because now you're attacking mm -hmm. this knight on c3, a second time with the queen here, and the bishop can't move, say, bishop d4, bishop d2, because rook takes b2 still happens. So I really hate white's position as move 8, but it just goes to show if you don't really know your openings that well or start playing some offbeat junk, for lack of a better term, <laughs> you can get in quick trouble. Totally. Let's have a look at the other boards, but Whoa. Jeffrey will let's, decide whether Bishop A6 is the move. Let's look at Kuparadzi's game. That's Gika Kuparadzi playing Andre Gorvets because Kuparadzi sacrificed a piece. Oh. Or did he lose a piece? I mean, let's see. He took. He a, sacrificed on E6. Whoa! What? He, he's no. He, he like went lost the pawn to C2. Went D5. So Gorvets took that pawn. Bishop B5 check. And then he sacked a piece in e6 after that he'd already given him two pawns. Uh, uh, Anna? I'm trying to understand what happened here. <laughs> I'm going through move by move again. Uh, Anna? It's a piece, um, uh, it's a piece for um, nothing. There's some, there's some action because the king is still in the middle of the board, but so is the white king. And a6, b5 is like the perfect strategy just to get rid of this bishop. Totally. And so if he can't keep the pin, then bishop takes d7, queen takes d7, it's a piece up. Yep. So now b5 and white is totally lost. I mean, it's just you're, you're down a piece. And then my knight can yeah. move. Like after your bishop moves, they can play knight e5. Just cent yeah, this is, okay, I don't want to look at this anymore. It hurts. So Christopher Tulin is playing um, Nika Volkov. And Christopher Tulin loves having these pawns around some dark squares. That's what I'm yeah. learning about his games. Preparing for another knight of six. But wait, so he's going knight of six or trying to do something like that. Can c5 be captured? Good question. Okay, you can't capture, wait, can you capture with the bishop or the knight? I mean, you take with the knight, mm -hmm. then bishop e7, queen e7, knight d6. I guess, but I don't know if this is enough. So you're down a pawn. So I don't know if this is like full compensation for white or if black should just be better. I think black's better. I, mean, I, hmm. I you know, you're you, you're trying to undermine the black pawn structure on the queen side, but I've taken a pawn. So how can I be unhappy about that? Um, yeah, completely. He's considering whether to take on c5 with the knight or trade. But uh, bishop takes c5, he goes for bishop takes c5, maybe he believes it's safer. Yeah. And also, I, I don't see why not. If knight takes c5, knight takes c5, what is it that white has for the pawn? Nothing. A pair of bishops. Trouble. But the knight is, yeah, the knight is coming in on d3 and b3, so I'm loving it for black. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. The knight is infiltrating. As soon as I move my knight from d5, I can put bishop on e4 or use this long diagonal. This just looks great for black. So we're, you know, I liked. At first glance, Tulin's control over the dark squares, but if you're losing your pawns in the process, you're not going to have control for much longer. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Tulin has been the MVP so far of this battle royale, but maybe in this last round, he became too optimistic about his attacking chances. And Nika Volkov is not an easy opponent. We know that he's a 2100 whose blitz rating is 2500. So he's a very good player in in shorter time controls. Yep. He's a scary player to face in this league and a great addition to the Tbilisi gentleman, that's for sure. Um, What's going on in the... Well, I was going back a bit to the Kuparadze game, but it is just still a piece up for Gorovets. Yeah. Full minor piece up. Your king's in the center, but... Even if I played a move like knight c4 on castle queenside and gave up my knight, I'm still going to be up at least a pawn. So uh, looking yeah. very, very good for Gorovets here and should be easily winning. In the meantime, Jeffrey, did he go bishop a6 against Jobava? Let's just see a move eight. Jeffrey Jean had the chance to play bishop a6. He didn't do it. He did it one move too late, I think. Um, it's not the same because like this, Jobava had the chance to play e5. And g4. Yep. They traded queens. And f6. Oh my. 
So I traded queen. 98? Uh, if you have to play that move, it doesn't look like the position is good for black. Well, f6 followed by 94 was really smart by Jabal. Instead of taking back immediately, he's going to take yeah. back with a knight just to give your king a check. And okay, so we're at this live position under bishop h3. And honestly, black, uh, I was going to say he's doing well, but then I realized not really because white can just castle queenside and you can't yeah. use the g file. You have control over g1, right? So white can't actually get to the g-file, but black's not doing anything with that file either. Oh, wait, I, <laughs> you're gonna laugh at this, Anna. I thought the king was on c8 and the rook was on d8. Like I'd castle- Really? I just thought that like, you'd castle queenside because like your king's on d8, it looks really bad. No, uh, it's just terrible. I was like, um, yeah, castle queenside for white and what can you do about the d7 yeah, board no, and the d5? I, now that I really think about it, instead of, in my head, the black king was on c8, the black rook was on d8, so I had essentially castle the queen side, and I was going to say, can I double in the g-file? But you can't double in g-file because your king is stuck in the center. White can go yeah. b3, c4 to kick this knight out of d5. d7, as you pointed out, is going to be hanging. Knight to f6 is also a useful move, just getting rid of this knight from the d-file. Yikes. Yeah, uh, suddenly a game that Jeffrey was doing very well after... Eight moves. If he had played bishop a6, we really thought that he had great chances. And now he's on the defensive now with pieces that are not coordinating at all because of the king being on d8. The d5, the d7 pawn is vulnerable. Also, now this knight f6. Wait, knight f6? Uh, I was impressed first, but on a second thought, what is this? So he's just trying to open up the file, but I don't love his decision here. I also don't. Um, isn't he? How's that? Can... Bishop e4, bishop e2, bishop f3. They're, they're like <laughs> uh, not so many squares for the white rooks. Bishop f2, yeah, it's a good move because the rook's trapped. Both the rooks are like, trapped. Bishop e2 is a threat. So I guess bishop e1 here for white. But then we, we might see a draw. Bishop e1, bishop e3, bishop e2. And he just gives up the rook with rook e1. Exchange sacrifice by Jabawa. Um, I'm not convinced. You know why I'm not convinced is because the back rank isn't good for white, right? Like, yeah. if you take on one with the rook, what's your next move? You can't really easily move your rook off the back rank because my rook comes to g1 with check. And maybe I can mm -hmm. play rook to b5 to swing my rook over to d5 or h5. Yeah, this is, this is too speculative of a, of a sacrifice. Yes, I saw that Jabava had really good winning chances after castle queenside, but knight f6 allowed this bishop to f2 move, so I don't think that knight f6 was the best by Jabava, even though he's a great attacking player, of course, and it's very easy for us to be criticizing them in hindsight, but that was a critical point in the game, and now Jeffrey has chances again, maybe even to win this in exchange up, and he's pinning white on the back rank. Yeah, this is gotten sad very quickly for Jabawa, went from, well, his opening was bad, then his position was great, and now he's yeah. simply down in exchange. Although, okay, so d7 can be captured. But then the h2 pawn will drop as oh, well. Oh, and, and b2 pawn. Yeah, b2 and h2, and yeah, you're right. If, you know, Because rook takes d7 is check, and the king doesn't want to go to c8, because then I lose my f7 pawn as well, but you have king e8, and yeah, like you said, h2 is falling. And behind h2 is the bishop on h3, which is under attack. Yeah. And uh, there are a couple of you asking about the game of Anish Giri, and we all know how important this is. <clears throat> so let's look at it. Give... I think uh, Robert is going to win because I love Anish's position. Okay. So Anish is even on material, has a better pawn structure, has a safer king, is castled, controls the f file, has a more. Uh, Advanced queen, that's hitting e6 and g7. Do I need to say more, or do you, you, you kind of get the picture of what Nishgiri is happening here? Yeah, totally. I, I don't see how Gregorian is going to um, find a way out of this strategically much better position for white, plus cutting the king on the f5, so black can't even castle. And, and Anna, the reason why I kind of belabored the point was because I just want to... I want to take this in. I'm expecting some nice chocolate. I'm really savoring the moment here, being like, oof, you know, this is uh... also actually another thing about it. Savoring 
and chocolate mm -hmm. don't really go i mean because like it's sweet right so it's yeah. like savory savory and sweet yeah and I, I get it i get it yeah, i don't know um, i don't know what's happening with, with an my oxymoron yeah. do you have a favorite brand that i need to buy mr hess i'll let you i'll let you just you know you'll you'll have to figure it out you i trust you we're, we're partners here i trust you I'll think about it, but <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I mean, Anish is going to win this and I'm going to be very happy for him because he should do very well. He's the husband of my best friend, so I'm rooting for him. But, you know, guys, chocolate is chocolate. <sighs> I saw a comment, Hanson can't deal with pressure and I'm looking at Hanson's game here and he is getting rolled over by Vlad Dobrov because Dobrov is not even up any pieces right now. But if you look at that game here, White can go e4, White can play for e5, and just steamroll in the center. This is terrible. Hansen is having an awful day, and it's getting worse. Yes, it's not a good finish for the Chesbra, the main Chesbra. He started with zero out of three, then he bounced back with one victory. But this is going to be a painful finish for him, for sure. Yeah, I mean, e5 is a threat because the queen is overloaded, protecting this bishop on a6 and trying to defend this e5 square. So, I mean, this is really bad. Really, 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 really bad. And if you move... The Let's move on because we have too many Chesbra fans with us, and I think this is a feels bad man moment. Okay. That no one wants to appreciate. <laughs> uh, what about... Hmm. I'm trying to look up another exciting position. I keep going back to Anish's position. Well, it looks like... Jeffrey Zhang has won in the meantime. I just pulled it up at, right after uh, the resignation happened. Jeffrey was up in exchange and he converted, it looks like, with ease. He simply started taking pawns off the board. And once he won the F pawns, it was all over because now his king is safe and he has passed pawns on that side of the board. Conrad Holt won his game over Luca Pachazzi. And I, we didn't see this game at all, but I, I mean, I, at the corner of my eye, I saw Conrad was up, up a piece. So I don't... The Dallas Destiny are crushing in this match against the Tbilisi Gentlemen. It's good news for the Eagles. They may catch up with the Tbilisi Gentlemen in the Eastern Division of the Pro Chess League. Yeah, this move 29C5 for Conrad Holt won him the game because the knight on before now sees a second attacker and um, the queen is under attack for black. So c5 wins the knight on before and Conrad Holt made easy work of the remaining position up a piece. And okay, just to get to the end, up a bishop, Luka Pachazi resigns. So that leaves Volkov and, two, whoa, what's happening here? Volkov? I was going to ask you about this because just the move before, there was a bishop on e6. So bishop takes e6, knight e5, knight f5, and I wanted to ask your opinion. Who is giving mate here? Well, I don't see even a single follow-up for white. So you, whoa, just don't take that rook. So what the intention is, if you take the rook, queen g6, queen g7 is checkmate because the knight protects the uh, g7 square. Yeah. So don't be, don't be foolish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it takes the knight and a five, logical, because there's no queen g6 check. And if queen takes h6, then he takes the rook, but it would be perpetual check. Right. So if you ever take the rook, it's perpetual. So maybe rook to f7 is just like the safe move. Yeah. Um, but yeah, because knight d7 is queen g6, and this is a very common draw. Queen g6 to h6, king g8 to h8, just, you know, they follow each other. Hmm. Rook f7 is on the board, so this is already three minor pieces up for black. Three? I didn't even... and... Oh, time. Yeah, well, that was, that was I think, uh, the least of the worries of white. He has given up way too much material for the attack, and Nika Volkov defended perfectly. Yep. So do we go back to Anisha's game? Because it feels like, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. It's what crucial. Whoa. I don't know if I... What happened? I think Anisha is not going to win this game. You're kidding. Isn't he just losing his bishop on e6? What, Safpin? What did he do? Why, what? He took on e6. And he just 
The guy went king to e8 to a... Oh my god, that's brilliant! He, he must have missed king to e8. What a genius move, threatening rook d6. And the queen cannot come out of the e5. Rook d6 is the threat. Wow, that's amazing. A queen f4 check, was it? Sam Copeland! Sam! 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 Sam. Move of the week! Yeah, I mean, because queen f4 check to get out of the pin. But look at this, just... I mean, Gregorian escapes it. Wow. And yeah, wow. That is... And plays very accurate because after G takes H5, Bishop H7, and then he can take the E6 Bishop. Wow. No, that... Wait, but... Wait, so... If Anish goes, then none of us will win. I think we should do this. We should just buy each other chocolate. That way, okay. we both I like win. it. Yeah. I like that idea, but I'm sorry for Anish. Because he was... He was in the driver's seat for the whole game. He was about to score 6 out of 7 for the chess bras on the top board. But then he blundered his King E8 move. But what a move, King E8. I mean, kudos to Gregorians for finding it. Yeah, I'm going to show that one more time as like an instant replay because Queen F4 check was the idea to get out of this pin. So if it's King to E8, and your queen has nowhere to go to keep protecting this bishop as all the surrounding squares are covered. So he went you know, for this, and he just went Rook D6 and won that bishop. That's, that's brilliant stuff, frankly. That's a really, really high level. Um, it's really impressive, and now with the piece up, uh, it's just about a technique to convert it into a full point. And Gregorian has managed to upset a couple of stronger grandmasters already in uh, Arena Kings, mainly on chess.com. And now he, he's proving it again that he's a very resourceful player. Yeah, wow. I mean. I can't believe it. We need to switch. Yeah, I, I, I can't see this. I I, need, I will need to talk to Sopiko Whoa, after. This what's broadcast. going on with, with <coughs> Eric Hansen? I what just happened? All of a sudden, he got a big attack going. He should have been dead lost and strategically lost, but he somehow got his rook to b two. Oh. How did he do that? And then he took this pawn. Oh, look at that! He sacked his queen. Ninety four. He was going for that typical, you know, checkmate ideas down the mm -hmm. second rank here. He couldn't... Beautiful. Wait, oh, he... Eric, coming back with this queen sack. But I'm not sure, is it enough? That's the real question. Uh, yeah, he almost swindled his way out of the game, but Dobrov defended precisely. He didn't take the queen, and now after rook b3, this trade on b3 will mean that black is running out of attacking pieces and time. Time, yeah. 17 seconds. <gasps> Time's always the problem. So. Oh, what did he do? He went queen b4, and I guess king to g1 or queen to e2. I like queen to e2 because you're getting your queen possibly to go to e5 with check, and it looks like a counterattack is coming very quickly. I uh, don't take on e6. Oh, king g1 he played, okay. So now play queen e2 still, or do you have something better? I don't know. And by the time we are looking at this game, I've just realized that the bras, they used to be at the middle of the standings, approximately like fifth place or so. Now they are almost at the very bottom. Only the turtles are doing worse wow. in the chess bras. This is a really sad finish for the chess bras. Although Anish Giri is now in rook and bishop against rook. I don't know how he got here, Ooh. but he's going to hold this. I feel very confident. But let's go back to yeah, the, the other game because, okay, we can see rook and bishop forever. Um, this game between Hansen and Dobrov, once again, Hansen, it looked like he was escaping. He had a terrible position on the opening. But now with Black's king is feeling safer. That seems counterintuitive. The king's an f6. But because I have a bishop, right, I can get my queen in the dark squares, my bishop in the light squares, and queen c3 here to go to e3. That feels like the natural move. He's taking too much time. Six, five. Four, four. three, two, Oof. don't flag. 3.8. He got it. He got it off in time. So remember, everybody, you gain two Ooh. seconds per move. So um, it's there's an increment here, and he went queen e4. So now I'm thinking queen d2. Very good. Control the dark squares. King f2. All right. Queen takes b3 though. H4. Yes. H4 counterattack. Four seconds left. 15 for Dobrov. Two. Yeah, he just. I would play h4. Oh. <laughs> What's Nine he? seconds for Dobrov. This is a game of nerves. H4. Do Oh, queen e1. I'm not sure about that move. He wanted to give mate on e7, but bishop e4 blocks the e4. Queen f2 and now check. threatening queen g2. 
Wait, queen f2, what happens to the queen trade? Queen f2, king f2, there's two passed pawns there. I think black yeah, is the- Yeah, connected passed pawns for Eric and an active king. I I think this is very promising for black. But h5? Who's, who's faster? Yeah, the h pawn is very quick, unfortunately, for Eric. Play king but... e1. Oh, he didn't play king e1. I thought there's no king e1. Take... He's gonna give up the bishop and now with the- Yeah, isn't he just making a draw now king d2? Yep, so uh, rook- I oh, just go king there, yeah. That's yeah, the... king and pawn in game c1. He's gonna go for it. Yep. Yeah. White is giving up the rook for the c pawn, and he will take the d pawn with his king, and it's a draw with two kings on the board. Uh, and Ishgiri has made a draw in the meantime, Robert. Um, yeah. Can, can you remind me of a bet that was going on? Um, I will after we look at this Nikolai Noritsen game, but no, okay. <laughs> the bet that was going on, I owe Anna Rudolph chocolate. Okay, Yay, wait. best news of the day. And I'm happy for Anish too, because after his blunder, he had to save a draw. So actually, good result and also chocolate time. Oh no, Ves Vasily Usmano blundered. And look <gasps> at- I didn't see it, I didn't see. It's now Nikolai Noritsin who gets queen against rook. So we <gasps> saw him on the other side of this. On move, uh, what move was that? 60, black could have just kept going rook g1, rook f1. Instead, yeah. black went b1 equals queen. And after, he thought he would take on b1 and have a draw at the end of this. I'll show after the game. But instead, white promoted, and now we'll see queen against rook. And, well, Norton mm. lost. Oh, there, he won this game already. Queen f5 check, picking up the rook. So let's go back to that moment, critical moment yes. here. Move 60, king e7. He could have played rook to g7 and just followed this pawn, saying, you take my pawn, I take yours, we'll make a draw. Uh -huh. Instead, totally. he promoted and I understand why you would promote to b1, thinking if rook b1, rook b1, g8 equals queen, now I have rook check on b7, king to f8, and I give you a check here, I take your queen, we make a draw. So that was- But then queen f5, that stepped into the fifth rank, so couldn't he just play queen e1 or queen e4, so that when there's a check, he gives a check too? Yeah, I guess that, you know, that was, probably better one of these moves but it's so hard to play a move like that when you're giving up so I know I no time on the clock so rook g1 would have been way more practical of course yeah just I mean a really just a bad decision by black to promote and then an, a bad follow-up of course when queen f5 happened to uh well you just lose your your queen so a great way to end the day here the chess bras at least can celebrate something Hansen survived Geary survived and finally, Nikolai Noritsin won his game. So they actually scored two points there to do much better than I expected them to at the end. But Totally. Now they are sharing the fifth place. So the points for the fifth, sixth, and seventh place will, place will be split between those three teams. Yeah. So they, they split those bonus points. And, well, we can um, bring up the individual boards once more before we sign off to mm -hmm. see, you know, Anish Giri, five and a half. Anna Rudolph. Great at predicting people's scores. She gets it. Christopher Tulin, the MVP of today's session with a runner-up going to Vlad Dobrov for the Wizards. He went five and a half. Uh, so did Christopher Tulin. And, but Tulin really led the destiny to match victory because he was more evenly matched, let's say, with uh, these players on board four, yet he was the one who just started uh, beating everybody up. Totally. Robert, it has been such a pleasure commentating with you as usual, but Alexandra and Danny must be ready already for the next group. So I think we will need to say goodbye and thank everyone for tuning in. And stay here, don't go anywhere, because the next Battle Royale is about to start with Danny Ranch and Alexandra Botes. Yeah, the, the mat games are in, start in 13 minutes, but we're going to sign off, let them come on the show. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our mods, tea, coffee, chess bay, everybody. Who's in there? Benjamin, everyone. We need a Raksha Hardy, also thank you. Well, sometimes. <laughs> exactly. We need a mod named Bagel, right? I mean, just feels right. Chess Bagel, I guess that yeah, works. Yeah, let's use some Bagel and some hype in the chat. If you guys enjoyed the stream, remember that if you move your mouse over to Robert's side, somewhere below his camera, there are the magical purple buttons, and you can click on Robert's channel, follow him if you like what we are doing. I also stream now more often on my channel. I'm streaming with John Urshaw tomorrow on John's channel and on Sunday on my own channel. Robert, any upcoming stream that we could plug? 
Um, hopefully soon. Yeah, I definitely plan to stream some more. So um, yeah, it's you know, sometimes tough with all this commentary, but I love it. So I'll definitely be seeing more of me. But for now, we're seeing we're, we're going to sign off here. Thank you, everybody, for making this a great day of chess. And there will be more to come in just about 10 minutes. Indeed. Stay here for the rest of the show. Bye-bye.